The scene opens up where a horrible bear was attacking an old man. The old man, frightened, exclaimed for the bear to stay away and not come closer. Our protagonist was stunned to see both of them, and he wanted to help somehow. Up until that point, he was just an ordinary person. Since the armored bear was occupied with the merchant and did not know the protagonist was there, the protagonist had the chance to run away. The protagonist disclosed how horrible of an adult he was, as he always looked up to firefighters who had always been helping people. They were like heroes, and he always wanted to be like them, though he had already given up on that dream. All of a sudden, he was stunned to see the place where he was. He was on the last train going home after working overtime, and then it was pitch black where he was. Just then, a screen board popped up in front of him, disclosing that he had been summoned to another world. There were three options of roles below, out of which he was requested to select one role. The options were Brave, Weissman, and Demon Lord. In the middle of that, the protagonist wondered if he was just tired. He further stated that he did not think he could fulfill a great destiny. Such a troublesome thing was a no thank you. He was not even smart in the first place. If he were smart, he would not have ended up in a black company. It was just the same with being a king or a brave hero. Either way, it was a death flag. He further stated that he did not like the conclusion, so if it was possible to choose none. He was waiting for that screen to answer him, and further, it showed up, a hidden option indicating that he would be given substandard abilities. The screen board then showed how to begin the transfer to another world, and the protagonist, named Kukusaka, would now be blessed by the spirits and the gods. Afterwards, the sun rays were coming on Koi Kusaka's face, and he found himself in a forest where he could not understand what was going on. He felt like this was surely real, not a dream. The birds were chirping, and he was stunned if that was really another world. Further on, when he checked his pocket, a smartphone, a wallet, a handkerchief, and a tissue, there was nothing else in his pocket. Excited, he wondered what he should do in that forest from now on. All of a sudden, a status board popped up in front of him, showing he was level 1, with HP 50 and MP 1000. To see that status board, he remained astonished since somehow there were a bunch of MPs. It was disclosed that MP was a numerical value of Koi Kusaka's magical power. It was a relative value when the general magician had a hundred, and it recovered at a rate of 1% per second. Kukusaka felt like it was a game, and that was getting even more entertaining. There was a skill named Full Assist that helped him out in different ways. When he was searching for the other skills, a message popped up asking him if he wanted to activate Full Assist to install skills faster, giving him the freedom to use his skills. Kukusaka replied positively since it was his very obvious answer. Suddenly, something happened, and a message came informing that the installation was complete. Kukusaka held his head since he felt like something flowed into the back of his head. From the time being, he wanted to try all the skills out. The first was item box. He touched the target, which was the tree, and as soon as he touched that, a circle appeared around the tree. He was stunned to see that. Hold on. If you guys are loving this video, make sure to comment. We are loving it, because that is how I get to know that. Now, getting back to the story. Further, the screen board showed the item box, which included one cypress tree. To see that, Koi Kusaka got excited since it was convenient. The next was dismantling. It seemed that he could mainly use demon corpses as food or materials. He wondered if he could also dismantle the tree, and just then the screen showed the cypress wood was five. The next up was creation. He wondered if he really had such exciting skills. About creation, it was disclosed that the creative god's power resides within Kukusaka as a skill, the highest production skill. The materials were consumed to create new items, and additionally, a special effect was granted to the created item, having a higher performance than usual. Further, he got a cypress stick, not a cypress tree. He seemed to be very excited to just make it. He started the creation to try it out. He then immediately took it out of the item box, and he got a cypress stick. It was a stick aid from the shavings of Japanese cypress wood. Japanese cypress trees were sturdy and difficult to set aflame. Kukusaka was amazed to see that it was just a stick but still amazing. The granted effects of the cypress stick were durability uh, and incombustible S+. The screen further showed that the creation was now ranked 2 due to skill experience point acquisition. As Kukusaka understood that it means the more he makes, the higher his rank, and the amount of recipes would also increase, which was convenient for him. He wondered if that window could open or close. He thought about what he could do. Then, the window mode switched to the image mode, and he understood that it could all be done in his head. That was why he should be careful. He further got to know that there were more recipes. In the very next moment, he got the cypress wooden axe, which was a sharp wood axe carved by a skilled woodworker, and its sharpness was akin to that of metal. 
since he did not know much about his appraisal skill, he had never used a weapon before. He then figured out that the skill was for that, and he just threw the axe onto a rock, due to which the rock got broken, and Kukusaka was stunned to see since it was strange to break the rock with wood. However, transfer, full assist, creation, dexterity, artisan god's eye, dismantling, item box appraisal, there were still some skills which he did not quite understand yet. He contemplated if that much was possible, then, he should be able to get by in another world. Further on, he was ready to raise the creation's rank a bit and prepare some equipment. After a while, he sighed, and with that, it was now rank 5. There were three things that he learned from that. Experience points were gained whenever creation was activated with a new recipe. A rank up occurs when the experience points reach a certain value, and an existing recipe would not give any experience points, no matter how many times it was repeated. Also, there were eight recipes made from a Japanese cypress tree, and each item has its own granted effects. The next item was the cypress chair, and the granted effects were faint effect as Kukusaka wondered why a chair has such a dangerous effect. All of a sudden, he came to remember that he wanted to get to a village before the sun sets, as he did not want to sleep in the field, and he walked out. After a while, he realized that he had walked quite a lot, but he still did not feel tired at all. He thought that was all because of the transfer skill, which was of rank 99, and it was the special skill that greatly improved the physical capabilities, mental strength, intuition, and growth of those who transferred from a different world. The language fluency of that world was also added. He then thanked this transfer skill since because of this, all five of his senses were sharpened, like sight or hearing. Just then, he saw something and wondered what that was. He tried to concentrate on hearing something, and he heard a screaming man. He ran in a rush to take a look. When he reached there, it was an armored bear, a bear-like demon with a steel-like outer shell. It was a dangerous bear looking for a fight. The armored bear was trying to attack an old man, who was holding a weapon and tremblingly asking the bear to stay away. Kukusaka realized that the armored bear had not noticed him yet, and if he wanted to run away, then it was his chance. The old man was frightened and seemed like he was struggling to save himself. Seeing him, Kukusaka, in the end, thought that he was important, but then got a second thought if it was really okay. He contemplated that he once wanted to become a firefighter to help people without any regard for danger. They looked very cool, and since then, he wanted to be like them too. But he was upset as the thing he was trying to do right then was completely opposite to that. Since he ran away then, that person would surely be killed. He thought there should be something he could do. Though he had already given up on his dream of becoming a hero, he had the skills then. With that thought, he jumped over to kill that armored bear, holding that axe, and just then he attacked the armored bear, due to which the bear's neck was cut down, and it fell on the ground. The person was stunned to see that. Kukusaka then stated that he did not have to be a hero, but he wanted to be someone who could reach out to someone in need. The person, being worried, asked him if he was alright. The person then thanked Kukusaka for the help on that occasion. He introduced himself as Chrome, and he was a merchant. Further, Kukusaka introduced himself back, and to be honest, if possible, he would like Chrome to guide him to people so that he would not seem like a weird guy. Moreover, he told me he was a woodworker. Chrome was surprised that he did not look like a craftsman. That was what Kukusaka also thought. Chrome further asked him if he made the wooden axe by himself since it was incredibly powerful enough to be able to defeat an armored bear in a single blow. Kukusaka was astonished if an armored bear was really that strong of a monster. Chrome asked him if he did not know, so he explained to him that an armored bear was an rank monster. When one starts rampaging, it was able to destroy small villages overnight. He added that even if he tried to subdue the armored bear, its body was as hard as armor, and most attacks would not be able to hurt it. Kukusaka proudly stated that he blew it away with a wooden axe. He then confirmed from Chrome if he did something pretty amazing. Chrome replied positively, saying that he would like him to think so too. He stated that the sun was going to set soon, and his mansion was in the cut ahead, so he approached Kukusaka to go and walk over there. Suddenly, both of their eyes caught something. Kukusaka asked Chrome if the carriage's baggage was all right. He replied that both the coachman and the horse ran away during the attack. He said since leaving the merchandise was regrettable, but he had no means of carrying it. Kukusaka stated that he wanted to help and he got an idea. He asked him excitedly if Chrome wanted him to carry it in his item box. Chrome took a pause and replied that he was looking forward to seeing his useful skill, although he asked him back if there was not going to be a problem concerning capacity. Kukusaka calmed him that it was alright because its capacity was unlimited. 
He then used his skill to put all that stuff in his item box. On the other hand, Chrome was surprised to see him. Further, he asked to bring that armored bear with him as well. Chrome, astonished, asked him if he was really him on the earth. Kukusaka chuckled. He stated that he was just an ordinary woodworker. Chrome commented that if he was ordinary, then the world would be ruled by woodworkers. Kukusaka disclosed that he had been practicing in the mountains until then, and that was why he did not understand common sense at all. Further, on the way to the city of Onan, Kukusaka tried to gather information under the pretense of he lived in the mountains and he was unfamiliar with common sense. Since he was able to learn two things, talent type and intelligence type skills, they were present at birth and could never increase in number, and there was a limit of three skills per person. And the people of that world did not have the concept of what a level was. That was why, no matter how many monsters a normal person might kill, there was no explosive growth to be expected. Kukusaka's abilities were just abnormal, and it might be possible to aim to be the world's strongest as it was. He further asked Chrome since there were monsters like armored bears along the highway, then why did he go without an escort? Chrome replied that it was rare for such a thing to come out. Besides, he did also hire escorts, but when the mercenary guild guys saw the armored bear, they ran away. Kukusaka wondered what a terrible story to leave the client. Chrome told him that he usually hires high-ranking adventurers from the Adventurers Guild. And it just so happened that they were out, so he called out to the mercenary guild. Kukusaka put his options that he felt a bit distrustful that the mercenary guild let irresponsible people work. Just then, Chrome asked him to have a look there since that was the city of Onan. Kukusaka was kind of excited that it was a city in another world, and he was eager to know if there were elves or beast men. When they both moved further, they saw the people chattering there that an armored bear came out and they were claiming that they desperately fought. Someone stated that Chrome panicked and went straight into it, and he was killed by the armored bear in the end. There was another person who was regretting that if he only had the ability to, then he could have protected Chrome. To hear all of them, Kukusaka understood that those were mercenaries who ran away, and it looked like they were reporting a lie to save themselves from abandoning the quest. All of a sudden, the mercenaries saw Chrome, and they were astonished if Chrome was not killed. Chrome replied that he was alive, then introduced Kukusaka who saved him. Kukusaka asked him if he was trying to shake him. The mercenaries were just staring at Kukusaka, so he decided to show the evidence. He smiled. He further introduced himself as a woodworker, and as he revealed that the armored bear had already been defeated. Someone stated that it does not seem like a lie, and there were other people who were chattering that Kukusaka's luck must be on the good side. Among them, one person asked the mercenaries since they stated that Chrome was dead so what was the meaning of that? They all started shuddering, drowning in the thoughts, and sweating all over there. Just then, Chrome disclosed that they did not fight the armored bear, even they abandoned him and ran away. The person understood that they have been telling lies since then, as abandoning a quest that endangers the people's lives was a great offense in this country. So he apologized for that, but he was going to have to bring them in. He further put out the ropes and asked them to show their hands. But one of those people seemed boiled with anger. He pushed that person away who was asking him to put out his hands. He asked if just because he received some request, does not mean die, then apologize. Kukusaka jumped in between. He asked him if that was not being so selfish. Kukusaka tried to attack that person with the chair, but the person faced it with his sword. The person screamed at Kukusaka to not get in his way. But Kukusaka refused, he threw that person's sword and hit his head with the chair. Due to the attack, the person thumped on the ground. So, Kukusaka understood that it was strengthening and the faint effect of S everyone was staring at him, and they appreciated him. They wondered if that was not the B-rank mercenary docks. They stated that Kukusaka's swordsmanship skill has always been overbearing. They picked Kukusaka up, and they were celebrating the moment. After a while, they went to the wagon. The night had completely sunken during the time Kukusaka was being interrogated, and that was only natural because he had a fight right in front of the guards. It was rather sympathetic, but he was saved. The person who was interrogating told Kukusaka that there has been more and more troubles lately concerning the mercenary guild. The Adventurers Guild was quite a well-regulated organization. Kukusaka thought if the mercenary guild was going to be alright. But keeping that aside, he was thankful to Chrome for being his endorser as he was able to enter the city on and safely. They were then on the way to his mansion right then. He was happy that he did not have to worry about an inn that night. Thereafter, Chrome told Kukusaka that they had arrived. Kukusaka was stunned that he was somewhat aware of it, but Chrome was seriously rich. When they were at the entrance, there were people standing side by side to welcome them. Chrome asked Kukusaka if they should go, and they went in. 
Further on, they had luxurious food. When he went into the guest room, it was just like a luxury hotel room. He rolled on the couch. He exclaimed blissfully that he did not want to go back to modern days anymore. He further contemplated that even if he was able to return to Japan, the only thing that awaits him was company life. He did not have a lover, and his parents have already passed, and if he was being honest, then he did not have any regrets in the world over there. He was amazed that the world was better, it was a lot more attractive. He pondered that it might be a good idea to travel freely and enjoy another world, so he decided to go find a place to stay the next day. In the next scene, Chrome and Kukusaka were having a conversation, where Kukusaka seemed stunned to hear that he was getting a month's worth of lodging. Chrome agreed with her and said that it was also the thank you for him who saved his life. He further asked him because it was hard to live in the mountains alone, so before anything, why did he not get used to that town while relaxing at an inn? He disclosed that it was also an inn owned by his company, so they could guarantee quality service. Kukusaka understood that Chrome was not just a merchant since he was the head of a large company called Scarlet Company. Kukusaka further disclosed that Chrome was just disguised as a merchant to remind him of the scene of being one, but it seemed like he was going to hand over the position to his son. Chrome exclaimed happily that the gods must have let him meet Kukusaka to serve as a retirement pay for him. Kukusaka replied that it was not a big deal, since it was just that he had nice skills. He clarified that it was not the outcome of his own efforts. Chrome then stated that he would like to give him a piece of advice as an elderly person. He said that there was a great contrast between drawing a good hand and using a good hand. He further revealed that there were countless numbers of people who were unable to make use of their skills for good. To hear that, Kukusaka remained astonished. Chrome added that Kukusaka was making excellent use of his skills. Furthermore, he saved his life, and he told him that he should be proud of it. All of a sudden, Kukusaka got that click into his mind. He thanked him and claimed that he would remember it. Chrome then asked him that if he eventually wanted to see the world then, it would not be best to register in the Adventurer's Guild. He said that if it was his abilities, then it would be easy getting a high rank, and a guild card could also be used as a substitute for an ID card. Kukusaka replied positively that he would go register at the Adventurer's Guild. Chrome suddenly remembered that there was a story he heard from a veteran adventurer that was about how he should wear armor when he registers, then he would be treated like a weakling if he would dress like that, and that was how he concluded the conversation. Kukusaka thanked him, and he then started contemplating where he should get the armor from. After a while, he got the idea, and he went to see the materials in his skill. The screen asked him if he wanted to equip it, and he replied positively. As soon as he agreed, something magical happened, and he found himself in the armored bear armor made from materials taken from an armored bear. He felt fine wearing that. The granted effects of armored bear armor were strengthening physical defense a plus, strength s plus, and hearing enhancement a since it was perfect for an adventurer's debut. The scene then shifted to the adventurer's guild. There were a number of people. They were stunned to see Kukusaka wearing that armored bear armor. Someone recognized him as he was the person who beat up the mercenary at the gate. The people were chattering that he was a bear killer. They wondered what that bear killer was doing in the adventurer's guild. Were they going to bear someone up? If that was the case, they stated that they would have already been massacred by then. Someone guessed if he was an adventurer, and if so, then was he in a rank or S rank. Kukusaka disclosed that he was a rookie adventurer and smiled, thinking he could listen to all those gossips because of his hearing enhancement. Further, when he went to the reception, there was an old person as a receptionist. When the receptionist saw Kukusaka, he immediately left from there, pretending that he was feeling a bit sick, so he swapped with a lady who smiled and welcomed Kukusaka to the adventurer's guild on and branch. The receptionist's name was Milia. She commented on his armored bear armor, saying it was some great fashion. She informed him that it was the general information window, so she asked if there was something she could help him with. He replied positively, remembering that Chrome told him not to use honorifics. So he told Milia that he wanted to register as an adventurer. Milia was stunned, asking tremblingly if he wanted to register. After seeing her react like that, Kukusaka wondered if he could not register. She apologized to him and disclosed that, since he was well equipped, she thought he was an active adventurer from another country. He replied negatively, revealing that he was just a newbie, so he apologized for the disappointment. Milia stated that she did not mind and then asked him to complete the Adventurer's Guild registration form. After that, he needed to take the practical exam. While filling the form, Kukusaka wondered if such bothersome documents were the same in both Japan and another world. After a while, when the form was done, he handed it over to Milia. When Milia read the form, she was stunned to see that in the appeal column, 
he stated, he was not good at rough things, even after wearing such armor. Kukusaka further clarified that he was being serious and would like to avoid fighting as much as possible. Putting that aside, she agreed to accept that for then and told him that he had to take the practical exam next. She asked him if he wanted to take it then. He thoughtfully asked her what they did in the practical exam. She replied that he would be sparring with an instructor, but that day's exam would be handled by a former A-rank adventurer. She cautioned him that the former A-rank adventurer always boasts about being stronger than an armored bear, so the exam might be a little hard for him. The scene then shifted to the underground training area. There were people gathered there, and Kukusaka was confused about why all the other adventurers were staying behind him. The adventurers were whispering that today's instructor was Jai's, who self-proclaimed that he was stronger than an armored bear. They were having conversations about which one they were betting on. Kukusaka understood that it was not a show and was stunned to see everyone there. Nilia asked him if he was okay. All of a sudden, she, being excited, told him that he did not have to beat the instructor anyway, as long as he was an adventurer. It was all right to lose, but she stated that if it was Kukusaka, she felt that he would definitely win. Kukusaka, filled with enthusiasm, claimed that he would not let his guard down and would just go all out. When holding the weapon, he felt like that cypress mallet would weigh over a hundred kilograms. It did not feel heavy all because of the strength S+. Plus. When he was practicing with the cypress mallet to swing it, the other adventurers wondered if he was lightly swinging a hammer like that. They were expecting the bear killer to kill today's instructor. All of a sudden, there was silence all over there as the instructor arrived. He pointed to Kukusaka as the rumored bear killer, saying he seemed quite strong despite being young but asked him to let him show that there was always someone above him. Kukusaka contemplated that the way the instructor acted was just like any veteran would. He was sure that the instructor was pretty strong but determined that he could not let his guard down on that one. Kukusaka and the instructor took their positions. Milia confirmed from both if they were ready, and she announced to start the game. Kukusaka, standing there, was thinking about how that worked. Just then, the instructor told him that it was an exam, so he requested him to come to him. He then understood that he should take the instructor up on that offer. He swung the hammer once, twice, thrice, but every time, the instructor saved himself. So, Kukusaka further got to avoid a large swing with only minimal movements. That was a former a rank, and he understood that if he only attacked like that, he would not be able to buy him. On the other hand, the instructor was asking to be quick. So, Kukusaka changed his technique to attack him. The instructor stated to Kukusaka that his attacks were too big, there were gaps everywhere, and it was hard to avoid with a mallet that heavy. Kukusaka still kept trying to hit him, and he was saving himself as well from the instructor's attack. The fight was getting intense, their both weapons were clanging one after one hits. Everyone was stunned to see that the weapon on the instructor got broken by Kukusaka, and just then, Milia ran in between them and asked to stop there. She further announced that the victor of that match was Kukusaka. The other adventurers were astonished. They wondered if he actually won against that instructor. It was not bad, and they were cheering him up. The instructor then came to Kukusaka to accept his loss and to appreciate him. Kukusaka thanked him, asking, being worried, if he was hurt. The instructor replied negatively. He further stated that it was a peculiar way to use the item box. The world was really wide, and he also thanked me for teaching him something. He then drew his hand forward to shake it with Kukusaka. He informed Kukusaka that he passed that exam, and he has high expectations for him in the future, while everyone was clapping and congratulating him on his victory. After a while, the guild card was presented to Kukusaka. Afterwards, the conversation was between Kukusaka and Milia, where she was telling him that she never imagined that he would be able to defeat the instructor in a single blow. She commented that he was really strong. Kukusaka blushed as he gave all credit to his skills. Even he wanted to say that he was just a small fry, but that would just be rude to the instructor. Milia then requested him to refer to the booklet for the guild rules. She also proposed that if he had time, then she would explain the important points too. She guessed that her explanation was easy to understand, that was why she recommended that. Kukusaka was worried about what that was going to be. Milia then disclosed that there were seven adventurer ranks in total, while Kukusaka was S rank right then. The highest rank was S rank, and the lowest one was F rank. The guild would decide a rank up based upon an adventurer's succession of requests and subjugation history. On the contrary, there were ranks down and expulsions. Also, she said that acts like false reports to the guild, client betrayal, guild card forgery would lead to severe punishment, so she warned Kukusaka to never do them. Milia further explained that to accept a quest, it was needed to bring the request form and his guild card to a counter. Kukusaka further explained that it was a rather game-like system. 
being excited, Millie's disclosed that once he reaches B rank, he would receive compensation money whenever he got injured, and he would even receive a pension once he got retired. So she concluded by asking him why he did not try aiming for B rank first. Afterwards, she thanked him for listening with her bowed head. It was disclosed that if he thinks about the future, he would lose nothing in getting a B rank, but for the time being, he decided to focus on raising his rank. Furthermore, Milia asked him why he did not go ahead and accept a quest. She recommended a quest to collect to Naos Grass. Kukusaka was stunned as he felt real quick. He wondered if Naos Grass. Milia replied positively that they could be found in the nearby forest and were used in medicine. She further told that the client was the pharmacist's guild. They often get requests for it since it only grows in monster habitats instead, and the reward was 400 kamsa per naos grass. Kukusaka calculated that the reward was going to be 20,000 kamsa, which he found a pretty good deal. Milia then told him that the demand for medicine was high, and there were some risk allowances provided. Further, there were some important parts on which she requested him to listen to that. She revealed since a rookie adventurer's first quest was to be accompanied by a high-ranked adventurer, and she asked him if he would like. He could go take to some adventurers that were free. Kukusaka wondered if it would be really that easy to ask someone. Milia thumbs up and replied to just believe in her negotiation skills. She claimed that her success rate was 100% except when she failed. Finally, Kukusaka agreed to counting on her, so she approached him to leave it to her. After that moment, Kukusaka sighed that he was relieved that he became an adventurer without any delay. He thought that he needed to thank Chrome again when he got the chance to meet him, since he did not only have him brought to the Adventurer's Guild, but he also had him around 80,000 Kamsa. He then thought that the shopping would be done at the Scarlet Company as much as possible. On the other side, Milia apologized to him for keeping him waiting. Just then, Kukusaka got to see someone with red hair like a sunset, crimson red eyes that were sparkling like a jewel and the dragon horns. Milia introduced that it was an rank adventurer from the dragon folk tribe, named Irisnut Fafnir. Irisnut Fafnir looked at Cuckoos. Akka, she greeted him by addressing as the rumored bear killer, and she allowed him to call her Iris. Kukusaka bowed his head and introduced himself as well. He thanked her for coming despite being busy. He told her that he was counting on her guidance. To hear that, Iris remained astonished. Also, just then, Kukusaka realized that he used honorific speech out of habit. Iris chuckled. She relaxed him as he did not have to be that scared, since they were both adventurers. She requested to just speak normally. Kukusaka understood. He also asked Iris to feel free to correct anything else. Thereafter, Milia told Iris that Kukusaka was a very talented person, but he grew up in the mountains without any common sense. She then declared that it must have been troublesome for Iris since the common sense of humans was different after all. Iris claimed as in that case, she would be the most suitable person. After a while, Kukusaka and Iris walked out of the guild. Iris asked him if he knew what they needed to do first. He replied that they need to gather information first. Since, whenever he goes to play a game, he always bookmarked the cheat website first. He told Iris that he did not know anything about Naos Grass in the first place, nor did he know what it looks like or where it even grows. He then stated to Iris that he would also like to know the distribution map of monsters around the area. Iris replied that if he prepared properly, he would get the results as expected of a rising star. Kukusaka further stated to her that she was overestimating him. Then, Iris informed him that everything he needed to know was written in that booklet which Milia gave him. Kukusaka flipped the booklet to see it. He saw that the first part has the guild's terms of service, but the second part was filled with information that even included the material distribution on the map of the surrounding area. He commented that it was like a strategy book. Iris disclosed that that booklet was made by Milia herself. Iris further told him that Milia was originally assigned to the guild headquarters in the royal capital, but the current branch manager called into the guild branch there in Anan. She added that the guild's atmosphere and the management improved with the current branch manager and Milia around, and it would be good to get along with Milia. Iris guessed that Milia would become an executive at the guild headquarters. She then declared to Kukusaka that he did not need to worry about it, since he was his favorite. Kukusaka wondered if he was her favorite, but whatever it was he knew that she was surprisingly talented. Iris asked him if there was anything else they needed. To that, he asked her to see further. He suggested that he might need supplies since he did not have anything else other than weapons and armor. For that, Iris told him to head over to the Adventurer's Street. The scene then shifted to the Adventurer's Street, where Kukusaka bought rope, a torch, water bags, and a flint as well. He clarified that he would put everything in his item box for then. 
Iris asked him if the capacity was going to be enough. Kukusaka replied positively that the capacity of his was unlimited. As Iris was stunned to hear unlimited, he understood that the ordinary item box normally only has a small capacity, since Chrome stated the same thing. Iris then told him that it was generally treated as a failure of a skill, and it was because there were a lot of magic tools out there that perform better than it, like she showed that she keeps a spear in the pouch. She added that all the high-ranking adventurers have magic items similar to that pouch, so she declared that his item box was just not normal. Kukusaka stated that he had a lot of other cheats as well, since the equipment was ready, so he asked her if they should start the quest. After that, Kukusaka and Iris arrived in the cello forest, where Kukusaka was looking around for the naos grass. Suddenly, he got to see the grass there, he asked Iris if it was okay to take that. She replied positively, and she asked him just to be careful when he was pulling it because it roots itself, and the leaves would shred off if he slid his hands on it. He guessed that he would need a scooper, but he refused and got another idea. He sat down close to that naos grass, Iris wondered if what was wrong. Since he did something, Iris was astonished to see that he successfully collected the naos grass. She shockingly asked him what he did. He chuckled. He told me that it was just a little use of the item box. He explained that he took the buried naos grass into his item box, as by using that, he did not have to pull it out, so the collection became easier. Iris stated as she thought that it was just a miss of a skill, but to think that it could be used like that. Just then, Kukusaka noticed another one too, to see that he asked if those leaves had some spots on them. Iris replied that it was Naolana grass, those could be stated apart from Naos grass by looking at the red spots. She further disclosed that it was a surprisingly tough quest, though, since they grow distantly from each other so a lot of movement was involved. And then he thinks he has finally found one, which turned out to be Naolana grass. She added that the request that time was to collect 50, which might take until the evening to finish, then they just needed to be patient with it. Kukusaka inhaled calmly, he clarified that it was the time to use that skill, named Artisan God's Eye. As soon as he used the skill, there was the sparkling all over there, and Kukusaka just pointed out the place where it was in the spur of time. Iris was stunned by how he knew. He then disclosed that Artisan God's Eye was a skill that tells him the location of similar items as the item specified, and it was simple if he finds one, then it was easy to find the rest. After about an hour of the quest, he was able to gather the 50 naos grass needed. After that, Kukusaka said that they only needed to get back to the city then. Iris wondered that it was something just in a short time. He replied that it was thanks to skill. Then, Iris bet that Milia would also be shocked by this. She then asked him since the quest was already over, so if there was anything else he wanted to ask. He, being hesitant, asked if he could ask her personal questions. He further asked her what type of people were the dragon folk tribe. Iris wondered if that kind of thing was personal. She then explained that firstly, the dragons were the strongest and largest beasts that have ruled over the earth since ancient times, and the dragon folk were the descendants of that. She added that their lives were much longer than humans, and their bodies were also much stronger. Kukusaka chuckled. He commented that this was making him envious. She stared at him, but she apologized since it was the first time she had heard it be put that way. He asked her if that was unusual. She replied that most humans keep their distance towards dragon folk mostly because they were afraid, and it was a horrible experience when they treated her like a monster. Kukusaka felt bad about it. He apologized to her when he asked. Iris turned around, stating that she did not mind at all. After a moment, she claimed that those words of envy made her happy. The scene switched up to the Adventurer's Guild where Milia was astonished that they both already finished the gathering quest for Naos Grass. Kukusaka put the Naos Grass to show her, and she went to confirm the amount. Five minutes later, Milia came back. She declared that there was no mistake that those were all Naos Grass. Furthermore, they were really fresh, and the roots were well intact as well. She, being surprised, asked him if he was able to do it, since it was impossible to collect it that beautifully. Kukusaka, as he explained how he used the item box, Milia rolled her eyes for future quests meditations which seemed like she would be reporting them to the guild headquarters. Milia declared that for the time being, they would be giving him the 20,000 Kamsa reward, and she made it clear that if his collection method was allowed, he might even get extra rewards. Iris reminded Ku that as she expected he was a rising star. He replied that it was just a coincidence. She then commented as it was also by coincidence that he was able to have a big shop beside him. So then, Ku's first quest was a huge success. After a while, he was in front of the Chrome Towers. He was prepared to go to Shoujutsute which was generally called a four-star onsen hotel in Hyogo. 
he wondered that no matter how he looked at it, that lodging was not for adventurers. He just changed his clothes, as he thought that he could not go wrong with a suit. Chrome had arranged for one of the top floor suites. Ku was amazed that it was bigger than his room back in Japan. He flipped the booklet to see if there was anything in the strategy book, as he wanted to go eat dinner but the restaurant in the inn was too expensive. He noticed in the book the Onan Gourmet Guide which recommended him to Kinkumana which was a golden bear restaurant. The menu outside stated that their grilled chicken was a hit, it was the perfect volume for 75 kompsa. He stated that back in the black company, getting a sip of wine after a meal was unthinkable. He was enjoying another world. He was determined to do his best in the next day's quest. In the very next day, Ku was on the Fado's Mountains. That day, the Adventurer's Guild requested to subdue five lonely wolves. It was an E-rank monster. And as the name implied, it likes to act alone. He remembered that Milia told him the base reward was 20 Kamsa, and if he managed to bring the fur back, he would get about 5,000 Kamsa per beast. Initially, he thought that it was a pretty nice job, but he has already been searching for about an hour then, though he did find three kinds of materials instead. One was Naos grass which was a medicinal herb found within the habitat of monsters. It had a healing effect when it was mixed with specific ingredients. The second was Lilium herb which grows abundantly in low-altitude mountain areas. It created a detoxifying effect when it was mixed with specific ingredients then applied. The third was Damp mushroom which was a mushroom with a lot of water stored in bulk, and it had slight magical energy, since they seemed to be unusable in creation but he claimed to use them to make heal potions and detoxification potions right away. It was asked from him since a container was required for liquid extraction, so he did he wanted to put the heal potion in a water bag. Ku replied positively. Just after, he pulled out the pouch of heal potion which was a luxury taste accompanied by the maximum recovery of heal potions and provided a refreshing feeling. Its granted effects were increased recovery amount and increased recovery speed. Ku guessed that it was probably an elixir, he opened it to take a gulp, it tasted like mint. It somehow reminded him of the company troupe that kept cheating on sleep with mint tablets. Next up were the detoxification potions which immediately nullified mild to moderate poisons. It had an elegant fragrance and taste while balancing sourness and fruitiness, and its granted effects were delicious, enhanced detox effect, and enhanced detox speed. To Ku, it looked sort of something like a mouthwash. He took another gulp, but it does not seem that appraisal would lie about anything. That luxury grape juice was surprisingly good. Just then, a sound came of growling. There was a wolf roaring there. Koi clenched his weapon and exclaimed that the guy was a lonely wolf. The lonely wolf was a wolf-type monster that prefers loneliness. They make a pair during the estrus cycle, though they run away once the female is pregnant. Ku thought, why should he run away? He claimed that he would not even bother to comment on it since the target came to him, so there was no way he could let that one go. Further, he was ready with the weapons to face the wolf. As soon as the wolf jumped over, he swung his sword, and it led to a swift cut, bringing the wolf down in just one swing. He was surprised that his sword was amazingly sharp. He reminded himself that it was not the time to be shocked since he had to go collect its remains. Also, he remembered that if he brought the fur back, it would get him extra rewards. He was excited that there were only four more until he finished the quest, and they did not look like they were that strong. All of a sudden, he heard another sound of those wolves. When he turned back, there were more of those wolves. He exclaimed, aren't lonely wolves supposed to act alone? They all jumped over to attack Ku. But when he swung the sword, his accumulated experience points reached level 9, and his HP and MP increased. His physical abilities improved, and the new automatic collection skill usage met the conditions. He slashed the wolves down one after another. It was apparently a skill that automatically collected the monster's remains, for which he was really grateful since it saved him the trouble of collecting them. As he was done killing them, he noticed that there were more, so he had to kill them too. He wondered what was going on there or if there was a bargain sale for lonely wolves that day. He was stunned by how many were there. He kept slashing them, and finally he killed the last one too. It was a monstrous army despite their habit of being lonely. Ku understood that it was an abnormal situation, so when he went back, he needed to report that to the guild. Observing the surroundings, he remained stunned to see that there were more. This time, it was the lonely wolf female, a wolf-type monster that prefers loneliness. They make a pair during the estrus cycle and prey on males when pregnant. Ku screamed that this was why the males were running away. He could not say that he was not responsible for that situation. But he attacked the lonely wolf female, claiming that he would not fall prey to her. After that, his accumulated experience points reached level 16. 
His HP and MP increased, along with the improvement in physical abilities. It was also disclosed that his level went up by a lot that day. He contemplated if his skills would increase with his level from now on. If that was the case, then he declared that he was looking forward to it. When everything was done, Ku thought about whether he should rest his body after lunch. Just then, he saw two other people, a girl and a guy, panting there. Ku asked them if they were all right, as they looked like they were in a lot of pain. Both of them were stunned to see him, the guy tremblingly guessed if that was the armor who killed the bear. Ku introduced himself and told them he was an E-ranker. He allowed them to call him Ku if they wanted to. The girl seemed scared and shuddering. Ku asked her what was wrong. She stammered that it was best to go down the mountain as soon as possible. Ku could not figure out why, so he asked them if they were attacked by armored bears. The girl was shivering. She said that it was something else, something that looked like a giant spider whose size made it quick, and they could not even catch their breaths. She guessed that it was a black spider. She further added that a black spider was a dangerous monster, and if it was really one of those, then it should have been deeper into the mountains, although it seemed like it came out around there that day. Ku heard that they both were E-rank adventurers, and it looked like they were in Fado's Mountains for a gathering quest, a decent job with what should have been low risk. But then, they unfortunately met a black spider, and that thing was not something that rookies could face easily. The guy said that they did come across an E-rank adventurer by chance, and the girl guessed that it was a dragon folk woman. She believed that her name was Iris. Ku was stunned to hear about Iris. It was revealed that the black spider was in a plus-rank monster, much more horrifying compared to an armored bear. The girl was crying terribly, claiming that they owed Iris a great favor for protecting them. Ku wondered about that. Although he heard that the dragon folk were much stronger than humans, he did not even know if Iris was still alive. He further asked those guys if they remembered where the black spider was. He requested them to tell him the fastest way to get there. The guy showed him over there, but he was stunned if he was ready to go there. Ku replied that he was going to find Iris, and he asked both of them to go back. The guy tried to approach him, advising not to go, since it was too dangerous. Ku calmed him down, as it was all right. It was not like he was going to fight the black spider alone. The girl understood Ku. She told they would go ask for help from the guild. She requested him to take care of Iris for her. The guy was getting anxious if they were really going to stop there. The girl replied that she could hear the voices of the spirits. She suggested that they should just let Ku go as it was. Ku knew about the spirits from anime and games, but he asked the girl what the world's spirits were like. The girl explained that the spirits were invisible beings that held power over various natural phenomena. She disclosed that she had the skill spiritual guidance, and sometimes the spirits came and called out to her. The guy added that spirit guidance has helped them many times up until then. He stated to Ku that he could not stop him, but he requested him to not overdo it. The girl then requested Ku to be careful, and she gave blessings too. Afterwards, Ku ran out in a rush from there to save Iris. The armored bear armor's skill, named Hearing Enhancement A, got activated. He was praying for Iris to be alive. He was worried that he might be too late, but he tried to calm himself down. He thought she would be alright, if that was her, then he was sure she would be fine. He thought he was a calm and collected type of person but it seemed that he misunderstood himself. He wondered if he just met someone who could make his heart move. Just then, he heard some voices, so he decided to look over there. He ran in a rush. He noticed that it was as if something huge had rampaged over there. He wondered if the black spider did that. When he moved further, he remained stunned to see that there was Iris lying down on the ground, injured, and her clothes were torn out. Ku thanked God that Iris was alive, but he was surprised that the black spider left its prey behind. He guessed that it might be that this was a trap. Just then, he was astonished to see that there was a huge spider, and he understood that it was the black spider. It was disclosed that the black spider was a spider-type monster with a high magic-resistant body, high intelligence, and combined them with agile movements to hunt prey. Ku understood those agility, magic resistance, and help poison fangs. He called the black spider a fool who used Iris as bait and brought others down, as that was what he expected from an A-plus-rank monster. It seemed like the black spider was observing Ku, and in that very moment, it attacked him, which was quite quick. But Ku fought with it, attacking with his sword. He tried to slash it, but it did not affect him. There, Ku understood that he could not seem to land anything fatal. He reminded himself that he needed to rescue Iris, so he needed to end that before it's too late. He further attacked the black spider, but instead, he himself fell on the ground badly. The level up and the defense of that armor saved him there. But he noticed that he accidentally dropped the cypress wood sword, which he needed to pick up quickly. As he moved forward to pick it up, he got tied up with the thread of the black spider to the tree. 
The black spider caught him, which was bad, as he could not break free. He understood that he would not get out of there alive if that got into his body. He tried to focus on finding a way to get out. As far as he could recall, after he got sent there, he put an entire cypress tree into his item box. On the other side, the black spider was coming towards him. But just in that moment before the black spider reached him properly, he fell on the ground, being tied. When he got detached from the tree, he made fun of the black spider by asking if he surprised him. Since the black spider was looking in anger, Ku commented on the nice reaction. Ku further disclosed that the item box could store anything that he touched. That was how he was able to store both the tree and the thread that stuck to him. He was also able to get the wooden sword back, and all that was left was to just defeat that black spider. Ku then noticed that there was Iris's spear. He clenched it and requested his master to lend him his power, as he needed his help. After that moment, he courageously attacked the black spider, as the size of the sword made him easy to avoid. But the sword was not all he had. That was why he attacked it with the spear as well. This time, he hit one of its legs which got broken. Ku was struggling just a moment ago, which did not feel real. He was not able to show the true extent of his abilities because he was too impatient. But now, he was ready to kill the black spider. He exclaimed that it was not getting away. As the black spider was coming, Ku jumped over, claiming that it was the end. He hit its back, which led the black spider into two pieces. It was the end of that black spider, and Ku signed out of relief. It was revealed that the accumulated experience points reached 24. His HP and MP increased along with the improvement in physical abilities. Also, the new automapping skill usage conditions were met. Ku could see a map that looked like a map of another world. But it did not matter at that time, as he needed to look for Iris. When he reached Iris, he felt that she was barely alive but she was breathing. He needed to treat her quickly. He caught the pouch of the heal potions which increased the recovery amount and increased the recovery speed. He poured that on Iris, literally begging so that it would work. The potion was working its work. Iris was healing slowly, and she being fainted could recognize Ku. Ku exclaimed happily. Iris was still talking about that black spider. Ku then calmed her that there was nothing to worry about. He told her that the black spider has already been taken care of. At a time like that, since Iris could still afford to worry about others, Ku concluded her as a really nice person. He further asked her if there was anything else wrong with her body. She replied that she was about to die. Even her legs would not move. As the black spider's paralysis poisoned, Ku asked Iris to drink the detoxification potion. After drinking the potion, she opened her eyes. Ku asked her how it was and if she could talk then. She replied positively that the potion was amazing. She then thanked Ku for saving her. She stated that she owed him big time. She asked him if he did not have other things to worry about, so she declared that she could not just leave it as it was. He suggested then to take him out to dinner sometime. Iris winked her eye. She asked if he was perhaps inciting her on a date. As Ku was astonished, she clarified that it was just a joke as she tried to lighten up the mood. But she guessed she was not used to that kind of stuff. She further asked him to head back to the city. Just there, Iris fainted in the arms of Ku. Ku stated that it looked like it was going to be tough to walk for her. She apologized, and Ku picked her on his back. She confirmed from him that it seemed like he defeated that black spider. He replied that it was not like the armored bear where he killed it in one go. Iris, being surprised, commented that he did well doing that by himself. She asked him if he was not scared at all. Ku took a pause. He then replied that he was too busy trying to protect her, so he was not thinking of anything else. Iris buried her head into his neck. She exclaimed if that was so. He asked what happened. She replied negatively that nothing happened. It was just she thanked him. After a while, Ku and Iris reached the Adventurer's Guild. Those guys, one girl and a guy, were surprised to see him. They confirmed if he defeated that black spider. The girl stated that it was a good thing that he was not in a bad shape. Nilia welcomed Ku. She appreciated that he did a good job on the quest. Ku exclaimed happily that he was back. Nilia asked him if he wanted to have dinner and bath, but Ku replied that he would give the quest report first. Ku put Iris down so that she could take some rest, and he, along with Milia, went to the Adventurer's Guild reception office. Milia stated to him that she would like to hear his report while Iris was resting in the guardroom. But before she did that, she was going to let him in on one of her secrets. She showed up with a card. Ku noticed that it was an Adventurer's Guild staff ID card on which her fingers were hiding her age. He asked her if there was something wrong there. When he saw the card carefully, it was mentioned on the card that she was an Adventurer's Guild assistant branch manager. He remained stunned to know that. Milia clarified that she might not seem like it, though, she further disclosed that the current branch manager was on a business trip. Ku asked her, since she had such a high position, 
why she was a receptionist. She replied happily that the window work was a sort of a facade to the public eye, and she got to help out. Pooh was shocked, as he did not expect her to be in a top position at all. Milia clarified it was not like she minded it, but she only wanted to reveal her identity to him out of sincerity. After that, she bowed her head claiming that she was really grateful to him for the subjugation of the black spider because without him, many lives would have perished. So, on behalf of the Onan branch, Milia expressed her sincere gratitude. She further approached Pooh to end the stiff introduction there. She requested him to tell her all about his adventures. Pooh gave the disclaimer that it was going to be a bit of a long story. He started when he went and explained what had happened after he left the guild. Milia seemed interested in the pack of lonely wolves he encountered. Milia thoughtfully stated that perhaps they have some unknown traits which she had to report to the guild headquarters. She was even more surprised when she checked his subjugation history. She was shocked if Ku subdued 2048 males alone. She asked him if he was like a god's messenger or something. Ku replied that he was still him, and it went smoothly since those two briefed them on the black spider. Milia asked him what he used to cure the black spider's hemp venom, since a cure for it does not exist yet. Ku thought about how he should put it. He then explained that he made a potion and gave it to Milia. He handed the potion over to them so that they could recreate a cure for the poison. It looked like the Onan branch management would have a meeting by the next day. They stated that they should raise his adventurer's rank in the evening. After all, he defeated an armored bear and a black spider. Moreover, Milia declared to give the rewards for subjugating monsters that were a rank or higher and she said that the black spider should be worth about 5 million kamsa. Ku was stunned if that 5 million was not too much. Nilia replied that usually a subjugating team with a rank adventurers would be formed, so the reward would have split. Then, if Ku thought about it, when they got to the city's entrance, there were a bunch of adventurers there to rescue them. All of a sudden, he remembered about Iris. He asked Milia if where was Iris's cup, since she threw away her life to save other rookie adventurers. Milia declared that they would be giving her a suitable reward. She claimed that the Adventurers Guild rewards good deeds. Afterwards, Milia was filing the report right then, until then Ku came downstairs. There, he saw Jais, the instructor. Jais appreciated Ku as he heard all about him, how he defeated a black spider all by himself and that was the talent that comes every hundred years. Ku replied that he was selling him too high over there. Jais then asked him if he was free for right then. He replied negatively as he had to go eat dinner outside and return to the inn. Jais became happy to hear that good news. The scene then shifted to Kinkumade, a golden bear restaurant. When Ku entered there, the people were screaming out that they were waiting for their one's hero, the bear killer, and someone corrected that they should call him from then on Spider Killer. Ku seemed to be very proud of himself. He took a seat and grabbed his drink. He was enjoying his drink with others. Just then he realized that the city made him feel like he was already one of them. It was 11 p.m., and when Ku turned back, he saw that Iris had appeared. Everyone started to look at her. Ku contemplated if humans really avoid dragon folk, and if there was something he could do about that. At that very moment, a person fell into Koi's hand. Ku announced that Iris was coming. She was the one that saved them from the black spider. Both those guys, a guy and a girl, bowed their heads in front of Iris and thanked her for that day. Iris remained stunned. Ku also thanked her for her work. Then, keeping the work aside, he offered her a drink. After that moment, Ku grabbed everyone's attention to announce that he was not the only hero for that day, as Iris single-handedly went up against the black spider so that those two could run away, so he asked everyone to toast to her bravery. Furthermore, all the people cheered in the name of Iris. It seemed like Iris was happy and glowing thereafter. Through that, Ku hoped Iris could start to become accepted. It had been ten days since then, Ku had become accustomed to living there in Anan, although there were some slight adjustments. First was his adventurer rank. He was promoted from F rank to D rank instantly. Milia was very happy to announce that it was the fastest promotion in history. To get to C rank, he would need to not only subjugate and collect C rank monsters and materials, but he also needed to do city quests. The city quests were something like a do-anything-in-the-city-except-shopping type of quest. That day's city quest was Kinkumate Assistant. There was a guy at reception who greeted Ku as Brother Bear. Ku wished him good morning. The guy clarified that there was no need to be polite with him. He asked him to just do some prep work. Ku understood. He started to leave it to him. Ku was not yet used to the adventurer's way of speech. He went to the kitchen, which he called a battlefield. He was wearing a male wolf's apron, which was made from a male lonely wolf's fur. Its granted effects were master chef and launderer. There was an old lady named Akami. She was terrifying when angered. She seemed to be very happy to see Ku there. 
The, the next one was a female adventurer named Yahoo. She also became happy to see Ku since it had been a long time. After a while, Ku got to cook there, and he had never cooked for himself back in Japan. He cooked the meal, and in the spur of the moment, he just finished that. It was all thanks to dexterity and master chefs. He prepared the lunch sandwich, which became King Kimade's new menu item. They further showed it to the shop manager for his opinions. The manager commented that he already knew his brother Bear. Ku was incredibly efficient. He also declared to give him a nice extra for the quest reward. Koi was surprised, but he stated it was fine. The manager insisted on him since good work means good money, that was what a man's worth was. When Ku tasted the sandwich, the manager asked him if it was too spicy for him. Koi replied as that sandwich was something he would like to share with his company's management team. The second matter he had was help with the city wall expansion. Due to the increasing population and the condition of the existing wall, it was demolished and was undergoing renovations right then. That was the fifth quest that day, which I personally asked for. Just then, a guy came who asked Ku to hold there. He clarified to Ku that he would be counting on him again that day. He was a dwarf planet on site supervisor who was holding the hammer in his hand. It was told that dwarves were cheerful people who excelled in manufacturing jobs such as blacksmithing. Ku's job was to clear the debris from the construction. He put them away in his item box. As soon as he finished his work, everyone was applauding for him. After that, Ku heard over to the east side of the city where the dwarven workshops were. Further, Ku brought them the bricks from the construction site. After that, the persons over there offered some little drinks before going back to work. Someone showed he got some good booze over there, but Koi denied as he was in the middle of the quest. He thanked them for their generosity. With that, the quests for that day were over. He then went to the guild to report his results, and the rewards were then transferred to his account. From there, Milia went out from the guild. Just then Iris came to Ku appreciating his work. She asked him if he was done for that day. He replied positively, he asked the same question. Iris found it a coincidence, since she was also done for that day. She asked if he had any plans later, along with that she proposed to him for dinner together. Ku replied that he did not feel like eating meat that day. He agreed for beef, but a big no for chicken. She then took him to a nice place. Ku wondered as she had been inviting him to dinner almost every day. After a while, when they arrived at the restaurant, they ordered the do beef stew. Ku gave a compliment that it was delicious, and no complaints remained there. To know that, Iris was glad that he liked it. While having the meal, Iris asked Ku why he came to that city. He did not reply exactly but stated it just happened. He asked her why she came there. She looked at him weirdly. So, Ku understood. He relaxed her that if it was difficult for her to talk about it, then it was better to just forget about it. She refused that it was not like that. She revealed that it was stated there was a huge underground city buried underneath Anan and she was there to look for the ruins of an ancient civilization. It was disclosed that long ago, a highly advanced magic civilization once existed on that continent. Life, apparently, was much more prosperous back then, and they were not threatened by demon beasts. The ancient civilization had eventually perished, but that had left traces here and there across the continent. Recent investigations foretold a large underground city located somewhere near Anan. Ku then asked Iris if that was what she was searching for. She replied positively. Ku stated an ancient civilization. Speaking of highly advanced ancient civilization, as it was a common other world setting. He added if there was got to be some ancient super weapons just resting in the ruins. Iris said that she had clues on it. There was a fair amount of poems and documents about it. She further stated though, she still did not have a precise location of it. Ku excitedly exclaimed that it was kind of interesting. He did not think he had it recorded on auto-mapping. Iris then asked what that was. Ku explained to her that it was a map of the area, and he asked her if she wanted to look at it together, to which she agreed. They both then looking at the map, Iris pointed out on on there. Meanwhile, Ku was thinking something. She asked him if what was the matter, but he replied negatively. Ku further asked Iris to show him the location of the underground city. Iris replied if it was that easy, then everyone would know where it was. Koi took a pause, and after a while, they successfully pointed out the underground city number zero entrance. After seeing its location, Ku asked Iris since it was inside the cello forest, if they could trust it. He further asked her what she thought. She replied it was amazing that they found where the underground city was. Ku asked her if she wanted to go try and see it the next day, and she then replied positively. The scene shifted to Cello Forest, they were searching for the place according to the map. When they arrived there, they were surprised to see that nothing was there. Ku stated that even though he made equipment using the materials which he got from the Black Spider, he guessed that he would not be able to use them that time. 
He was wearing the Black Spider Gauntlet whose granted effects were Magic Absorption and Black Spider's Thread X. Iris went near the cliff, she asked if there was a hidden door somewhere on that cliff, and they should look around for a bit. Ku tried to check it with the punch, he also agreed that there was something, and he further tried to displace it, since he had super strength, but it still would not budge. Iris gave him an idea of how to put it in his item box. He instantly agreed with that. He touched the cliff, and they were surprisingly looking at it. After a moment, a door appeared. Ku was stunned if that was the entrance to the underground city. When he touched that, he felt its warmth, he asked if that was perhaps Orichalcum, and they both wondered to think of it. Iris stated that Orichalcum was another fantasy staple. She wondered if that was there since Orichalcum was a very rare metal. It had the best anti-physical and anti-magical defenses of its class, but the processing techniques for it had been long lost. They both thought that it had to be the entrance, but they wondered if there was a doorknob so how are they going to enter? There was something written on it which stated, Thy whom whence from the farthest, art thou blesseth by thine spirits. Ku asked what that meant. Just then, it was stated that the status check was completed, and someone welcomed Ku to underground city number zero, in order to judge the validity of granting master rights for the underground city. In the very next moment, Iris screamed out at Ku behind them a provisional trial should be initiated. And there, an Orichalcum golem appeared, it was an ancient large humanoid magic weapon. It was equipped with Orichalcum armor, and a rapid fire laser cannon located on its eye. Ku was smiling to see that, while Iris stated since it was made from Orichalcum, so she found that quite unpleasant to deal with. The Orichalcum golem stated that the target confirmed, and it was initiating elimination. Iris then told Ku that she was going to act as a decoy, so she requested him to escape. Iris disclosed that an Orichalcum Golem was an S-rank threat which was one rank higher than a Black Spider. She added that she fought one once, and it took 20 A-rank adventurers just to barely beat it, and they both did not have good odds there. Ku stated that he was not sure about that, and he would never know unless he actually tries, so he said that they need to decide on whether or not to run later. Iris stated that in the past, it would leave a bad taste in her mouth if she abandoned someone to survive. Just then, the Orichalcum Golem attacked on them, but they survived. So, that was the magic laser. Ku did not even want to know what would happen if he got hit. He then realized that magic laser meant it uses the magic power. He understood. He then asked Iris if she defeated that guy last time. She told him to aim for its eye, as it was the only part which was not protected by Orichalcum. Ku stated that they might win if they could get close. Iris immediately warned him that he could not get close since the laser would slice him up. Ku claimed to be the shield, he would blunt all of the attacks, so he clarified that he would be counting on her to put the eye out of commission. Iris took a pause. At first, she asked if what did he have in mind, but later on she understood that if they win that, he was as strong as 19 A-rank adventures. It was sounding like some interesting development to Ku. He further asked her to just move. Ku was ready to face the Orichalcum Golem. Orichalcum Golem extended the magic layout of his eyes which was about to touch Ku's gauntlet. But before it happened Ku punched it back by using the Black Spider Gauntlet's granted effect of magic absorption. He then decided to just keep absorbing that magic laser. Ku understood that his idea would work. He paid attention to his magic laser. Just then he asked Iris to attack on his eye. She successfully attacked its eye, and it was collapsing down. Ku exclaimed that he would not let him go. He tied him up. Ku did not just absorb that guy's magic power but also used that magic power to convert it to thread which was Black Spider's Thread X. The Orichalcum Golem was then tied up, and Ku was attacking on his eye with his sword. His eye got damaged, due to which he collapsed down. Iris wondered if they won since the Orichalcum Golem was powered off. Ku's accumulated experience points and reached level 38. His MP and HP increased along with the improvement in physical abilities. The provisional trial had been terminated. Orichalcum Golem subjugation had also been confirmed and the rights of underground city number zero master have been granted to Ku Kusaka. Ku asked to correct him if he was wrong, but he wondered if he had just become the underground city's owner. So, he stated that they could finally open that door. Ku thanked Ku for protecting her earlier since it was thanks to him that she was still alive right then. Ku replied that he should be the one thanking her there, as he would not have been able to do this alone. Iris claimed that she could not have done this alone either, but they work well together. She wondered as no one knew they could make a great team. Ku took a pause, he further asked to let go. The sound came which stated the magic pattern verification completed. It welcomed Ku addressing him as master. They both opened the door to the underground city number zero. Ku was then looking at the automatic collection and the item box. Iris asked him if he was perhaps a transferer. 
Koi remained quiet. She further stated that there was a legend passed down among them dragon folk, a bizarre entity from a distant land that started to possess an excessive amount of skills. Ku replied that it might make sense. He disclosed that he was indeed a transfer, but he requested her to keep that as a secret. She agreed, but she was wondering if he could tell her more about it, like what kind of place his hometown was or if it was probably not on that continent. Ku took a pause to contemplate what would happen if he stated that he was from another world, and if she would even believe him to begin with. He broke his silence. He replied that it was the farthest place one could never imagine, so he asked to just keep it at that. Iris apologized for asking, and she asked her to just forget about it. Ku refused that it was not like that. He clarified that it was just that it was hard for him to explain it. Iris understood him since she could not go back to her hometown as well, so she guessed the feelings of theirs were mutual. Koi then apologized to her for all the secrets, but it was all okay for Iris. She declared that she already knew that he was someone she could place her trust in. Keeping these things aside, Ku asked her to have a look over there. It looked like this lengthy tunnel was about to end. They both looked at each other and they sprinted there. They were then out of the tunnel, and they wondered to see there, since they went to where the underground city was. Ku stated that it was more or less underground. All of a sudden, they heard some rustle over there. Ku and Iris were ready to just face whatever it was, just then a slime appeared there. The slime told them that they got it wrong, as it was claiming it was a bad monster. It further added that it was not even a monster. It was disclosed that it was helper slime. Ku wondered if that slime was part of the place's staff. He added that it does not look like an enemy. Iris, being confused, agreed with him. The slime stated that they scared her for a second. It further greeted Ku addressing him as the master it introduced as they were the helper slimes. Ku was surprised if it just stated they. Just there, a lot of slimes appeared there. They were created just for the master's sake and they have been waiting for 4,000 long years for him. The slime started to tell Ku as one of them asked to leave chores to it, as it was also a great builder. Someone claimed that it could work in the fields and tend to the livestock. Another offered to call them wherever he was in a pinch. All the slimes were requesting Ku to take care of them, and he happily agreed. On the other hand, Iris was enjoying seeing them. She was rubbing the slime which causes tickling. Ku asked her what she was doing, she covered her face out of shyness. He asked her if she liked the cute things by any chance. She replied positively as she could not deny that. The slime asked Ku if he wanted it to explain the underground city to him, he replied positively. The slime explained that the place they built underground is a sanctuary in case the need ever arises. It added that it might be a grassland for them, but they claimed to erect a city soon. It asked him if it was the perfect time to bring their operations to a close. It was further disclosed that the full assist had established a link to the underground city's mainframe. The status check completed, and the hidden conditions were met. Also the creation skills effects have been expanded. Ku suddenly felt some energy inside him. He then went to Iris, who was playing with the slimes. He said that there were two functions added to creation with the condition he was in the underground city. He extended his hand, and a ball-like structure appeared. Ku then started to try building something over there. He showed his finger, and on the spur of the moment, a beautiful house appeared there, to see which Iris and Ku remained astonished. It was further disclosed in the new function number one that any excess magic power would be expended during production as building material. Ku had 10,000 MP right then. His MP recovered at a rate of 1% per second, so the extra MP added after it hit 100% would be used as materials, but he would get 5 building materials per second. The slime excitedly exclaimed that the underground city was still far from complete, and that was why they were glad that you would be constructing a magnificent city. It was sure that the underground city would prove itself useful in the future. Ku replied to the slime that he understood what it was trying to say, but the city would have to wait for a bit as far as Ku felt. He knew that the remains of an ancient civilization that was still functional was a huge archaeological discovery. So, even after that, he asked if it would be alright for them to do whatever they wanted to. Iris suggested Ku report that matter to the guild at least once. Ku contemplated that he should use the three principles of the working class, report, inform, and consult, for which they left the place with giving hope to those large groups of slimes that they would return to build a comfortable place for them. Hence, they returned to Onan for the time being. While they were on the way, Ku was thinking that he could have taken at least one of the slimes home because there was something that was preventing them from leaving for him. Ku and Iris arrived at the Adventurous Guild where Ku asked at the helping window for Milia. The lady who was attending them told them that Milia had to attend an emergency meeting as a proxy to the branch head which was why she was not there. The lady further stated to Ku that if he had any business with her she could put forward a word for him. 
Ku replied that it was unnecessary since there was a matter he only wished to report to her. The lady understood and told him that he could start with the report when he was ready. Since Milia was not there, Ku had to report to that lady that they had discovered the underground city of an ancient. Before he could continue, the lady understood that he was talking about the underground city of an ancient civilization and she was shocked about that. Iris told that it was the popular talk about an underground city near the area of Anan, and Ku found its ruins still functional up to then, and she added that they wanted to discuss future endeavors and how they should be handled. The lady ran from there to consult this with a superior, and asked both of them to wait in the reception office till then. A scholar from the royal capital was staying right there in Anan and Ku went to finish his lunch as fast as he could before he and Iris got there. When they opened their lunch boxes, Iris found the sandwiches so delicious. Ku then told her that it was Kinkumati's special item and he offered her to switch them if she wanted. Iris also gave her lunchbox to Ku to grab whatever he liked. As soon as Ku tasted the fried stuff he commented that Iris was such a good cook. Iris told him that she cooked in her free time and always ate by herself, but it was not bad to have someone to compliment it. Ku thought that Iris liked cute stuff and was a great cook and that was a quiet discovery about her. In the middle of their conversation, a person entered the room to see whom you thought that he had expected an old man when he heard about the scholar. The person's name was Larich D. Hubert, who was the third son of Duke Dom and an archaeologist. He apologized to both of them for making them wait. He told them that it was true that he was a noble but asked them to treat him as equals. It seemed that he was uncomfortable in the formal stuff as it caused his body to start itching. Thereafter, he asked Ku and Iris to tell them about the entire underground city matter. In the next scene, the three of them walk out to visit an underground city. When they arrived, Larich touched the door, which was of Orichalcum, and he was amazed to see the size of the door. It had a divine luster that made Larich want to slather his tongue all over it. Iris was surprised to see his reaction like that. Ku used his magic pattern to move ahead, and as soon as they entered, the head of the slime group welcomed Ku by addressing him as master. Upon hearing that, Larich was shocked. Ku then realized that he had not told Larich about that yet, although he told him that he found this place through auto-mapping and Larich came with Iris and Ku to see if it was real. When Ku told Larich that he and Iris defeated an Orichalcum Golan, he was in disbelief and completely dumbfounded by it before even going inside yet. Larich wondered if to find himself in the underground city for real. He could smell the grass and feel the breeze of the wind, and there was not even a speck of an underground environment. He was astonished that the environment was beyond the imagination by which the history of archaeology could change forever, and he took out his diary to write down the contents for his thesis. One of the slimes then came forward and introduced itself as a helper slime, which shocked Larich because he knew that the helper slimes were ancient magical creatures. The helper slimes asked him if he already knew about that. He replied that he was an expert on ancient civilizations so it was obvious that he knew everything about them. Initially, he thought that they were a hoax, but he was surprised to see that they existed. After that, Larich noticed a magnificent house there, and he asked the helper slime if it built that house. The helper slime replied negatively and told him that Ku built it in an instant. When Larich confirmed it with Ku, stated that the master of that place could build almost anything. Larich then understood that although it was called an underground city, it was basically empty, and thus the master Ku was given the rights to develop it. Further on, Ku asked Larich if it was really alright for an amateur to mess around with this place even if it was just a single house. That was why he went back to make a report. Larich replied that he was really glad to know that it was Ku who found it because most people just vandalized it without notifying them. He exclaimed blissfully that Ku knew how important this was to history, and he felt grateful to Ku forever. Moreover, he told Ku to let him know if he needs anything. To know that, he could ask for anything. Ku asked Larich about the ancient civilizations. Larich answered that there was nothing that he did not know of so he asked him to continue it in the house. A while after when the three of them went in the house, Larich found it weird to go barefoot outdoors. Apparently, the ancient civilization strictly prohibited shoes indoors. This was not anything new to Ku either and it was like he was at a house back in Japan. He had not thought of if this world was the earth far into the future and he might be wrong to call himself a transferer. Larich then explained to Ku about the ancient civilization that was a flourishing civilization in this world from about four to five thousand years ago. He further added that they possessed highly advanced lost magic technology, and the sky was the limit. They might have even expanded their reach to other stars and planets. They could not live without their magic lamps, showers, or stoves. Even the guild card and the subjugation history readers. All of those kings were excavated from ruins and further produced. But that was only a fraction of the history. 
going to and from the continent with a flying mechanical bird converging with distant people with a palm-sized box. To know all of that, Ku realized that this ancient civilization was pretty close to his previous world and society where magic was developed instead of science. Larich further continued that at one point, they were suddenly brought to destruction, and with the advanced magic technology lost, their ancestors lost their magnificence. Ku surprisingly asked why they perished and if there was some sort of world war. Larich tremblingly replied that he did not know the details, that according to the recent investigations, the calamity was what they referred to as the monster, it was very lightly the cause of the destruction. Ku further asked if the cause was an unknown monster. He was feeling bad and was hoping this was not the reason why he transferred there. Iris said that there were mentions of this calamity in her people's legend that both the dragon folk and humanity joined the forest against this calamity. It was a crushing defeat and the dragon folk lost everything they had. After the calamity went on a rampage, it went into slumber somewhere in this world. Larich disclosed that within the last six months, monsters had been acting up throughout the continent, and he did not know what it was, if this was not a sign of the Calamity's awakening. An armored bear and a black spider, who were reciting deep into the mountains, appeared near Onan and a pack of lonely wolves popped up in thousands and that was not out of the ordinary. Even though they had advanced magic technology, the ancient civilization was still lost. The Calamity might reawaken in this age and Ku did not think it was like that. Just then, a helper slime appeared there with tea and snacks for everyone. The three of them became happy to see the food and within no time they finished it all. After that, Larich stood up and clarified that he was jealous of the ancient people that they gotta eat this tasty food every day. Iris interrupted that she would get fat if she started to live there. Besides that, Larich asked Slime if from where they got the ingredients and tableware. Helper Slime replied that they have an item box to their bodies and they store all sorts of things in it. When she was taking it out, three of them remained stunned. Ku then understood that the ingredients used for the tea and pancakes they enjoyed came out of its mouth. Thereafter, Larich asked to come back to talk about the calamity, and he had a proposal. He asked Ku if he would like to build something. Ku asked him clearly what he had in his mind. Larich replied that his first motive was for archaeological research and his second was to prepare for the future. He further added that based on the recent events, he believed that something was likely going to happen to Anan. And if that even comes, this place would be a useful evacuation center. Ku guessed that it was not like anything would happen and archaeological research would be nice so besides, actually doing a city building, building game seemed interesting to him. Larich also agreed with his idea and got ready to work on it right away. The three of them then came out of the house, and Ku had stayed there for 30 minutes. His stock of building materials had reached 8,000, he could separately build the houses, but there was something he wanted to try out. He then suggested that it would be better if he could make them all at once. When Ku extended his hand to do something, Larich wondered to see a thing that appeared which seemed like a construction egg. Within no time, several houses were constructed there. Iris was praising Ku that he was amazing and it was like he was God himself. Ku exclaimed that she was flattering him as it was all thanks to the skill. Iris further stated that she knew it was the cause of this overpowered skill of Ku, but she claimed that there was nothing stronger than this. She was then about to disclose that Ku was from a transferred world, but she somehow covered it up. Afterward, Larich asked Ku if he could inspect it closer, and when Ku gave him permission he became too excited. The helper slimes were also there who seemed happy with the houses and one of them asked Ku if it was fine if they furnished the insides of those houses as well. Ku was okay with that and the slimes then went for the work. After that, Ku based it on Anan. With a residential area, farmland, and a trade district, the city was completed. When Iris and Ku were returning, Iris stated that she still could not believe that this area was all grass a few hours earlier. Ku agreed with her since he too was astonished by all this. He then felt that the creation had a lot of hidden potential. Just then Larich declared that the discovery alone was an incredibly big discovery for archaeology, and he would also inform his majesty about Iris and Ku. Ku was surprised to hear that he had his majesty, and Larich then showed his card that he had a degree and was an archaeology professor. Ku complimented him that he actually was a great person. Larich then told him that he developed magic city lamps, kitchen magic stoves, showers, and much more and he declared that he would be announcing a new magic tool next month for which he requested to look forward to. But he asked them to treat him the same as before since he tended to get really lonely. Ku and Iris agreed with him and they became a team to work together. All of a sudden, they started shaking and they did not know the reason. Iris guessed if it was an earthquake just then a helper slime came there with the news that something bad happened and all of them followed it there. 
When they arrived, there was a huge thing that appeared on the ground with magic circles. When they arrived at the location of the helper slime, she showed them that it grew out of the ground during the earthquake. When Iris noticed that pattern, she asked surprisingly if it did not look like the magic circle that appeared with the Orichalcum golem, and even Ku agreed with her. Larich was also in shock to see that, and just then, he guessed that this was probably the work of transfer magic. Iris asked Ku about his opinion on that. He cleared that they could not just abandon him. Thereafter, Iris and Ku extended their hands over the pattern and suddenly a map appeared on which seemed that there was only one path. And when they both came before Larich, Larich became happiest to see them. Ku asked what they would do if something happened. Larich was glad that they were worried about him, and he kept telling how happy he was. Iris gave him a weird look and stated that they were happy that he was okay. Thereafter, some kind of sound came from there, to hear which Ku immediately alerted Larich to go behind them since they did not know if it was a monster. Larich followed what Ku stated. After that moment, something came out of there wearing spectacles which looked like a slime, and it shouted Ku, and the others had got it wrong. Moreover, it clarified that it was not a bad monster. Everyone was surprised to see it. The slime further greeted them and introduced himself as the glasses slime, which was a small variant of helper slime. Ku, being confused, asked if this was the place. The glasses slime replied that this was the deepest part of the underground city, the deep territory which was one of the calamities, and this was the place where they, slimes, monitor the black dragon. Ku was getting a question so, he stopped it to hold up a minute and then asked if that meant there was a second, or might be a third calamity as well. Glasses slime answered that they were not sure about their numbers, but there were tons of them. Larich screamed out of fear that this was a shocking revelation and even Iris did not know that. Glass's slime was getting that they were shocked, and it was quite obvious, but the important thing, he told them, was that this area constantly maintained the seal but once the special conditions were fulfilled, it would be undone. Who further asked if that means the black dragon would be resurrected, and Glass's slime replied positively to that. They all were still in shock. Ku stopped him and stated that the black dragon was the thing that destroyed the ancient civilization and if this was a game, he asked if it would not be the final boss, as Ku clarified that he was just starting to get used to his Ice Sky lifestyle, but it was getting set on extreme mode now. Glass's slime disclosed that around the north was the Fado's Mountains, there lay a big mountain and that was where the Black Dragon was resting. Moreover, he added that there were probably less than 10 days before it reawakened. He declared to start expounding on the Black Dragon, but he asked them to switch venues for a bit. Afterwards, they all moved further while following the glasses slime and it showed them the magic tool whose purpose was to recreate images. He then asked Ku to try touching it once. When Ku rested his hands on that tool, a sound came out that the lock had been released and revival would be initiated from that point. A moment after, a screen popped up which was projecting a city. It was revealed that there were records from 4,000 years ago, and it was projecting one of the cities from that time. They all could see a dragon who threw the balls of flame on the entire city and collapsed it down within seconds. Ku was so shocked to see that. Glass's slime then told that there were more than hundreds of casualties and it only took a few seconds for thousands of lives to be lost. Moreover, he also told that the black dragon was just that kind of being. Ku realized that it was a whole other thing and he had not faced anything of this caliber up until then. Iris also put her opinion that it was like an earthquake or a flood or there could be more than just one calamity. Since Larich got frightened so much, he tremblingly asked Ku to head back to Onan right then and he also suggested that they needed to evacuate everyone in the Onan to the underground city. Ku agreed with Larich. After that, Glass's slime cleared it to Ku that he could not say for sure, but they should have another three days to spare. The reawakening of the Black Dragon against the completion of the evacuation, it was a race against time. Ku and others had glasses, Slime took them to the underground city using the transfer magic and they hurried towards Onan from there. The scene then switched up to the Adventurer's Guild, Onan where the people were looking tense and Ku wondered if what was going on there. Just then, Milia came there to greet Iris and Ku and she instantly thanked them for their work in verifying that on such short notice. She asked about the underground city. Larich stated that it belonged to an ancient civilization since there was no doubt about it. Further on, Milia stated that this was a historical discovery and if it was true, she proposed they should hold a party in celebration. But she clarified that it would be difficult right then due to current events. As Ku did not know anything, he asked what happened. Milia answered that the Fado's mountains to the north had been observed displaying the sign for a stampede. 
Goku wondered about the stampede. Milia then explained that in other words, it was a flood of monsters. Moreover, Milia added that around a few hours, thousands to tens of thousands of monsters would come out and at around 10 o'clock that morning, high constructions of magicules were detected beyond the Fado's mountains. The guild believed that around 50,000 monsters would appear within the next three days and it was estimated that they were going to attack Hanan. Larich was astonished to hear the number of 50,000 and he asked if that was not the kind of disaster that only occurs every century. Moreover, Milia said that the feudal lord's soldiers were wiped out three months ago by the stampede and due to this, he could not provide any assistance. Onan's war potential amounted only to the mercenaries' guild and the adventurers' guild and Milia said they believed that defending would be extremely difficult. Therefore, she had a very important question to ask and she requested to give her honest opinion. He asked if they believed that the underground city would be a good place to seek refuge. Ku replied that there were no problems and in the next scene they were all found in the underground city. Milia was amazed to see around there and she was in disbelief that they were underground. Just then, a person came there who stated that he heard they had succeeded. But to think that they would make it this far was really abnormal. The person was the branch head of one's adventurer's guild, named Zitten Barden. Ku stated to Zatan that everyone from Anan could be accommodated and requested him to allow them to seek refuge in this place and as far as he knew, that was the plan all along. Zatan thanked him and he was deeply grateful. The helper slime claimed to try their best as well and he declared that they would safely educate the people of Anan. After that, Ku had a question to ask. He cleared it that he hated to pour salt into their wounds, but he informed them of the black dragon. He was about to continue, but just then the glasses slime came to interrupt that this was becoming ridiculous. Ku saw the glasses slime being panicked, so he asked him to calm down first. The glass slime reminded them about the stampede beyond the Fado's mountains in the north and told that before any major stampede, a large amount of magicules was generated. However, it seemed that the magicules were starting to get excited. Thereafter, he disclosed that it looked like the black dragon that had been resting there was going to awaken earlier than expected for which he asked Ku if what they should do further on. And Ku was shocked with the horrible news. They all then went to the place where the screen was projecting the dragon, and Milia was astonished to realize that they had been living so close to a dormant monster like that. Zatan got to know that the situation was bad enough with just the stampede. The glass slime told that the stampede came earlier than expected, but they had at least until the next morning. And according to him, that should be enough. Ku contemplated that it means both the monsters and the black dragon had a possibility of attacking Anan simultaneously. Zatan then decided to return to Anan to make preparations for evacuation. And Ku also proposed to come along. But the glasses slime requested Ku to stay if he could since there was a place he wanted to show Ku. Ku wondered to hear that. And thereafter, he remained stunned to see what glasses slime showed. There was a vault inside the deep territory. Glasses Slime told that the people from 4,000 years ago left treasures for the master. Ku further asked which door he should open then. The Glasses Slime asked him to wait for a moment, and he stated that if it be true thou art a hero, agape the left door. If thou art certs the monarch of all demons, agape the central door. If instead thou art a sage, agape the right door and then claimeth heir to their legacy. After hearing all of that, Ku disclosed that he did not fall under any of those. Just then, a sound came which stated that the status check had completed and Ku failed to meet any conditions. This told that the ability creation was in profession and hidden requirements satisfied due to which all doors got opened. Afterwards, the three doors opened and when they moved ahead, Glasses Slime asked if what was going on. Ku told him to start from the left and they further went. Ku noticed a broken sword hanging there. The Glass Slime revealed that this was the Dragon Slayer's magic sword. The glasses slime further told the story that a sword handed down from myths, but it was destroyed in a battle against the black dragon 4,000 years ago, and he added that if a hero was to have it, they would be reviving the story. Ku chuckled. He then clarified that unfortunately he was not a hero either. Besides, he decided to go and collect it and wondered to see how it worked since it was all broken. In the very next moment, Ku was holding that sword in his hand and it got repaired itself. The glasses slime remained astonished to see that. He asked Ku how he fixed it without even being a hero. Ku told the reason that because he had creation and glasses, Slime knew that it was the god's skill. Further on, Ku told that he learned the recipe by storing the magic sword in his item box and he was able to restore and enhance the dragon slayer's magic sword, Graham. It was disclosed that God of War's blessing a plus improved weapon strength and sharpness and also added a self-repairing ability. Dragon Slayer S Plus enhanced Ku's and the Gram's abilities. God of War's server delivered a lethal blow when one injects magic into the sword. 
Ku had a doubt that if he actually could be a match for the Black Dragon and thereafter, he, he suddenly asked the Glasses Slime to check out the other doors and there was a literal artillery walker. The Glasses Slime introduced that thing to Ku that it was an ultra-high output magic railgun, a wide-range ordnance that would burn anything down and that was just the type to use against a stampede. To hear that, Ku guessed that he would take it. But Glasses Slime told that it was unreal and the only way they would have gotten that thing out of there was to use the high-capacity item box a demon lord had. Ku surprisingly asked if it was not infinite. But due to Ku's unnatural existence, the capacity of item box had approached infinity. Ku contemplated it was just what he thought then. Afterwards, he used something which created an Orichalcum armored golem. The golem greeted Ku. It looked like it was acting like the cause of advancing processing a plus. The golem then proposed Ku to rely on him when there was a stampede and it further greeted the slime as well. Ku clarified to him that he would call him again when he needed him. Thereafter, Ku being excited asked Slime to head on to the next door. Slime stated that he could not keep up with that Tsukomi act. Just then, there was something placed and Slime disclosed that it was the Dragon God's shield which was used in battle 4,000 years ago. But Ku added that the Black Dragon smashed it. Slime further told that not even a sage could return that back to how it was but perhaps Master could repair it. So, Ku decided to test it out once. A while after, he shocked to see that he could not fix it. Slime then guessed that it might be due to a lack of materials and Ku wondered if what it would be needed. Slime suddenly stated although he did not know the species, but what if the dragon god's ruby as it was said to only appear once every thousand years in the dragon fox nation? Ku smirked that if does not look like he had time to go to another country at the moment. He then got an idea that Graham and the destroyer golem should be enough to win that. Future on, Slime appreciated Ku for the work done. He then told him that he had one last thing for him and just then, took his hand to touch. He added that it might the spirits be with him. Ku was surprised with that. Slime then revealed that it was a good lucky charm as if he ever find himself in trouble. A spirit would come and lend him its power. Ku became very happy to know that since it would be very helpful for him. Then he came to think of what even was a spirit. It was told that spirits were beings born from a person's emotions. Although they might be unperceivable, they constantly look after you. The scene then shifted to the city where Ku went to Iris to ask about the city faring. Iris informed him that the evacuation preparations were moving along well. The guild staff had been a big help with their pacify and persuasion skills and that was why there was not any panic that arose. Ku was happy to hear that as it was a good thing. Iris then asked about him. Ku told her about what he got from the vault, things that would be useful in the fight with the black dragon. Iris was staring at him, so Ku asked if there was something wrong. Iris replied that he had not told him about it yet his reason for searching for the ruins of the ancient civilization. She told that he left the Dragonfolk Nation to search for their lost treasure, the Dragon God's shield. Ku remained astonished to hear that. Iris further told that it was lost in the fight against the Black Dragon 4,000 years ago, and due to that, she went to search for any ruins that were destroyed around that time. Ku then clarified that it would not be a problem if he already had it. He assured that he would return it to her. Iris hold his hand and asked him if his creation could knit restore the shield. Koi replied it was impossible right then, as according to Glass's slime, he needed something called the Dragon God's Ruby. As soon as Iris heard it, she took out the ruby out of her pocket and placed it. In the hands of Ku, Ku felt ruby a bit harm. Iris told him that if a transferer were to possess the shield, grace them with the ruby, it was a saying passed down in a dragon folk that was why, she suggested Ku should use it. Koi then asked to allow him. He was bit nervous while doing the process, but after some time, he was able to took out the dragon god's shield by which Iris remained amazed and she kept staring at it. Furthermore, she asked Ku if he was okay or if there was an issue since he was looking troubled. Ku replied that the shield was fully restored, but she could not use it as it seemed like she needed a skill called Dragon God's Shrine Maiden to use it at its fullest. Iris relaxed him by disclosing that there was not a problem. Ku wondered if why she was saying that. She then told that if it was just about the Dragon God's Shrine Maiden, then she had that. In the next scene, it was told that according to ancient Dragonkin folklore, a girl with the Dragon God's Shrine Maiden skill would be born every several hundred years, and the Dragon God's Shrine Maiden had two missions. The first one was to find the Dragon God's Shield, and the second one was to deliver the Dragon God's Ruby to the Transferrer. Every Shrine Maiden until then had failed to carry out their missions, and Iris had become the first one to accomplish both of her missions. Though, there were the chances. Supposedly, only one door should have opened, but all of them did. Then Iris had the one thing Ku needed, and it was like there was someone laying out everything for him. The scene further shifted to the Silent Moon Hotel where Ku was resting. 
he came back to Onan from the underground city to report to the guild, and the master of the guild, Zatan, told him to rest up to prepare for the next day. Ku was so tense and he realized that the calm before the storm really was nerve-wracking. Just then, Milia knocked on his door and asked him if he could spare a bit of his time. Thereafter, Ku took her inside, and she firstly apologized to him for interrupting him that late at night. But there was something very urgent she wanted to discuss. She started to tell what she heard that if the black dragon was to appear, then Ku and Iris had to fight it alone. Ku agreed with her and told that it was the gist of it. He further added that while Iris and he pushed them back, the other adventurers would go to protect the townsfolk and for that purpose, he revealed that he went to get something in the vault. Milia sighed. She understood and commented that it was dangerous to go alone so she gave him a ring. Ku read the words written on that ring. Thou who comes from afar, if thou shalt clash with the Draco, thou must empty mine vessel, and the vessel that carries the benediction of the spirits. When Ku noticed that it instructed to first empty his vessel, he wondered what the world meant. Milia amazedly asked if he could read it. Ku claimed that it was because of a skill. Moreover, he asked what that was. Milia revealed that it was the Ring of the Spirits. She had been told that it was given to her by a relative's grandfather and told to bring that ring to the one who would challenge the dungeon, if they should appear. Ku was still stunned to see that ring and suddenly a brightness came out of it which stated that the full assist had established connection to the Ring of the Spirits and due to Ku fulfilling the special requirements, the skill materia transmutation had been unlocked. Milia asked Ku if he caught a curse. He replied negatively and clarified that it looked like he gained a skill. Milia yelled due to shock that the skills were not something he was born with which means that he really was the one she was supposed to give the ring to. Ku guessed that it might be right and when he put it on his finger, the ring surprisingly fitted perfectly. Furthermore, Milia asked if he liked that ring. He exclaimed happily that it was a good ring. Milia then stated that it was a huge relief that she was able to bring in the right person. That ring was half the reason why she joined the guild too. Ku was getting somewhere what she was trying to say, so he asked not to tell him that she was planning to resign then. She giggled, and refused that she was not going to do that even if she was faithful to that found success of hers herself. Besides, she added that she would enjoy watching whatever great feat Ku creates from then on and she guessed he might even just massacre the stampede along with the black dragon and call it a day. Ku smiled and he was surprised to see that she was overrating him again. Milia further smiled and claimed that it was possible if it was he that did it. She cleared that they would be alright as well. Thereafter, Ku was yawning when Milia also got one, so she commented that his yawn surely was infectious. Ku replied that it was about time to go to bed. Afterwards, Milia stood up and told him to turn in for the day, and she was going to take a nap. She also requested him to take rest properly as well. She praised him for his good work and wished him luck for the next day. On the very next day, Ku was seen sitting in his bedroom. He was contemplating about the skill he got the previous day, material transmutation which created higher quality materials out of materials of the same kind. If Ku crafts 20 Fenrir furs, a certain equipment recipe would pop up and that was the Fenrir coat he wore whose granted effects were enhancing the physical defense, enhancing magical defense, and grace of swiftness. Ku was then ready and he did maintenance on all of the equipment that he would use in the next day's important battle, and beyond that, he was determined just to give his all. The scene then shifted to the underground city where the people seemed very excited to have the guests, and they were eager to give them a warm welcome. Thereafter, Ku saw the whole crowd there. He felt pleasure to meet them, and introduced himself to all as the master of the underground city and he added in his introduction that he was an active adventurer in Anan. I felt that he unconsciously spoke politely but he handled himself very well. He announced that they already have had arrangements for their living quarters, so he kindly instructed them to follow the directions of the guild staff and enter their place of residence. One of the people from the crowd asked Ku if he was perhaps the bear killer. Ku replied positively, saying that some did refer to him as so. The people were wondering where they had seen you before. You were chattering that Ku was seriously hard-working while doing garden work for a city. Quest and they heard that Ku was a powerful adventurer, but when they met in person, they found him actually quite a kind person. Iris was smiling to hear all of that praising words for Ku. Afterwards, Ku was thinking that the most surprisingly happy faces among them was a relief and he realized that this embarrassing moment was not all that bad. Just then, Milia came to Ku running in a rush with the information that they had just received contact from the scouting party, and the monsters had started to burst out north of the Fado's mountains. Ku suddenly guessed that the stampedes were coming. Iris then asked how much of the city had been evacuated. Nilia answered that it was about 70% through the schedules been moved up. 
Ku raised a question about what that means if they would not make it at that rate. Milia replied that as much as it pains her to make them two beasts of burden, she requested to start the counter-strike. Iris put her thoughts that she was just about to get bored of that place and she would be happy to go to work. Even Ku was ready for it. This was like she took the words from his mouth. Both of them then walked ahead without wasting any time. A while after, they had arrived near the mountains and when they stopped, Ku disclosed that they were right in between the mountains and on him. Iris said that this was the place where they fought and since there was not anywhere to take cover, she asked Ku if that would be fine. Ku was okay with that. Thereafter, Ku extended his hands to perform some magic to see which Iris seemed surprised and in the very next moment, a golem came out of the magic. Ku stated that he was going to blow it up anyway. Iris commented that Ku was such a bag of surprises as she was amazed to see that he could make stuff like that too. Ku clarified that it was all thanks to skill. The golem then wished Ku good morning and asked if there was a stampede. Ku replied positively. He told him that it was his turn and asked if he could do that. The golem claimed that he could do it at his command. After that, his eyes started shining and he thanked Ku since it was truly an honor for him to be handed a crucial role in his endeavors. Just then, Iris asked Ku to look over there as the monsters had arrived. The fight was going to start. Ku confirmed with Iris if she was ready and they both then determined to win over them. The golem informed Ku that the ultra-high output magic railgun had been energized at his command. After that, Ku commanded him to mow them down and he followed as well. The golem threw out some days through his eyes on that army coming from there which resulted in the big blast. Iris was shocked to see that power of the golem. It was said that one or two civilizations could probably be easily destroyed if one gets serious. Koi was then at level 71, and his HP and MP had increased, and the physical abilities had improved as well. He had doubts if he would be able to gain experience even if the golem defeated it. The golem further announced that fuselage cooling power had completed and the hostile cleanup process was commencing. Ku was very excited since it was the time for them to come in too. He decided to take the left flank and to leave the right flank to Iris. Iris understood that and she asked to do a competition to see how many they defeated. She also put the condition that the loser would have to treat the winner to dinner. Ku agreed with the condition and he considered that he would have to take this seriously. It was the time to fight, and for Ku, this was the perfect opportunity to test their Fenrir coat's abilities. He used one of the abilities Grace of Swiftness X. Ku wondered how time around him was moving slower. Up next, the black spider appeared right in front of him. Ku immediately swung his sword to slash him down and its head fell apart. Ku was amazed to see that it roughly took two seconds after activation to get there, and it was an incredible amount of acceleration. But it took almost 6 MP. His MP recovered at a rate of 1% each second. He then realized that he should be careful when he was going to use Grace of Swiftness X. When the black spider was moving, Ku smirked that it thought it could get away, and he then decided that he would use Graham's effect. He further used the God of War's slash S plus and cut that black spider. Ku noticed that his level had then risen again and it was then at a quite ridiculous figure. It looked like the more magic he charged into the God of War's server, the more range and power it had. Furthermore, Ku decided to try the full power of God of War's Sever S+. He just noticed that his Gram sword started shining and detecting the Black Dragon's resurrection. The Dragon Slayer S+, would then be activated. Ku felt that it looked like the real battle had only just started. Iris was also seen in the battleground and there were the wolves against her. As soon as a wolf jumped to attack her, she used the Dragon God's Barrier X to protect herself. And with only one slash, she cut the wolf down. Since one after another were there to attack, she understood that there was no end and she was surrounded by the number of wolves. Just then, Ku came in front of her and apologized to her for stealing her prey. Iris wonderfully asked if it was just him then, since he was so fat that she could not see a thing. After that, Ku informed her that there was an emergency as the black dragon was coming. Iris remained astonished to hear that. Just then, the golem called Ku to tell him that he would clean up the rest of those monsters and he suggested he should focus on the black dragon for which he wished him luck as well. Iris and Ku thanked him and they seemed very motivated. Iris told the golem to get along well, and Ku claimed that they were companions who fought together. More importantly, Ku clarified that it was the black dragon and it was stated that it was sleeping in the Fado's mountains. He then showed up the map and indicated the place where it appeared. Ku asked Iris if she wanted to go and she replied positively. After they had decided, he went for the location and a black circle could be seen there. Ku was surprised to see that it was almost like an egg just before it hatched. Thereafter, the egg started to crack and the extremely weakened black dragon came out of it. This was the calamity as the black dragon of extinction. 
The dragon roared to hear what Ku exclaimed while feeling dizzy. What a loud shout it was and it would be unbearable for a normal person. It was thanks to the transfer that all of Ku's debuffs were being negated but when he saw Iris very uncomfortable with the sound, he asked if she was okay. She replied that she was okay and asked him not to underestimate the strength of the dragon race. According to the appraisal, normal attacks did nothing against its cursed scales and only the dragon slaying magic sword could defeat the black dragon. Ku contemplated that if he had not found Graham in the fault, he would be running away with his tail between his legs. Thereafter, he held the Graham in his hand and was ready to do a little check first. The black dragon was way too high in the sky. It did not look like Ku would be able to hit it directly, and after analyzing the case, he jumped to attack the black dragon with full power. With his attack, the black dragon got a cut on his chest, and Ku seemed too satisfied that he did it. It was far from a mortal wound, but it was not a shallow one either. Ku then got the motivation that he could damage it. After that, the black dragon threw the ball out of his mouth, and to see that, Ku called Iris to leave that to her. Iris got it, and she claimed that a left debt was something she would pay back in full. That was why she declared that she would protect you forever. To protect themselves, Iris used the magic to create the barrier surrounding them. But the black dragon was still throwing the flames from his mouth. He was roaring constantly and was trying to penetrate the barrier. The dragon god's barrier X had finally cracked, and the black dragon entered into it. Iris panicked. Just then Ku came from behind to give her support. They both decided to stop the black dragon from moving first, for which Ku tied him up. As soon as the black dragon got tied fully, he fell on the ground. Iris asked Ku if they just beat the black dragon. Ku replied positively. But this was only for then, since it was going to break free any moment then. Even though Ku regenerated 1% of his total MP every second, he only had 40% of it left. So, Ku decided to put all his MPs into that one. In the very next moment when the black dragon was about to attack Ku, Iris came before him to remind him that she would protect him no matter what. Ku thanked her. Iris further exclaimed wonderfully about what happened to the black dragon. Ku told her that it would be nice if he just died already. Afterwards, Ku and Iris remained astonished to see that the black dragon recovered himself and he was standing even after being wounded right in front of them. They noticed that the sky was painted black. Ku suddenly started feeling dizzy, and he just saw that it was draining his MP. It was told that the Black Dragon of Extinction had activated Dark Fields, and that skill absorbed the MP of every living being within a 2km radius. Ku realized that it was very bad since its skill overpowered his MP region. That means he could not retreat using God of Speed's blessings either. Ku came to know that he would be at a disadvantage if that dragged out any longer. That was why he had to end that quickly, and there was no other choice. He decided to put every last bit of MP in Graham. He used the God of War's Sever S Plus skill, and the Black Dragon roared at him. Ku had about to have up, as he thought that if this did not do it then he was done for. He was using his skill, which constantly helped to make the Black Dragon weak, and on the other side, Ku was just hoping for it to do a little bit more to get a win over him. The skill of Ku broke the barrier, and when he noticed this, he wondered if he ran it out of MP. The Black Dragon then roared and threw flames on Iris and Ku, but still, to protect Ku, Iris came before him to remind her promise to save him. Iris further moved ahead and a way could be seen there. Ku wondered if he could see the path where he died. A real chance of death did not sound as bad back when Ku worked at the Black Company, and that was before he arrived in an ice guy and started enjoying life. Ku was a complete stranger, but they all, Iris, Milia, and everyone, warmly welcomed him. That was why he did not want to lose the comfort he had found. He angrily then refused to die and wanted to live. He swore that he would come home to everybody. After that, he came to remember about the Ring of the Spirits on which it was written that thou who come from far, if thou shalt clash with the Draco, thou must empty one's vessel, and the vessel that carried the benediction of those spirits. Ku noticed that all the conditions of transfer, fighting the Black Dragon, and depletion of MP had been fulfilled because of which the Ring of the Spirits was then temporarily activated. As soon as the ring got activated, Ku saw that his MP was rising above max capacity. He did not know what happened, but there was no mistaking that this was his chance. He mugged up the courage to attack the Black Dragon for another time. On the other side, Iris was seen lying unconsciously there. The Black Dragon threw the flames to do the counter-attack against Ku's. Thereafter, Ku hit the Black Dragon, which led him pinned to the ground, and it was bleeding miserably. It was still roaring at him to try to protect himself. 
In the very next moment, Ku slashed him, which resulted in it getting torn into two pieces. Furthermore, Ku declared that it was his victory. There was a distant hymn, a time when the black dragon scorched the surface to ash. While the ancient survivors were constructing the underground city for three nights and three days, the prayers they lifted up became a spirit. The spirit could not fight against the black dragon. But in the distant future, it would appear and aid the transferer. One who answered their 4,000-year-old prayer, they offered to one their deepest gratitude. Days after defeating the black dragon, a victory celebration was held when he returned back to the city. The crowd was thanking Koi and Iris that they were all able to ride out a great storm unscathed for which they cheered in the name of both of them. The entire crowd was super happy with the victory of Ku and Iris against the black dragon, and because of which they even gave the new name to Ku a dragon killer. They were celebrating Ku since he was the star of that day for everybody. They were not stopping from appreciating Ku for whatever he did for them, and at around the end of the party, Chrome came there to meet Ku. Chrome thanked Ku since that time he saved the town, and he praised him that he had really turned out to be the person he expected that he would be. Ku thanked him for that, but he cleared that he was not worthy of such praise and stated that he just happened to be fortunate. Thinking back at it, a lot of it were coincidences that helped Ku along the way like finding the underground city, Graham, and the dragon god's shield, and the ring of the spirits. It scares him to think about having missed any one of them. Further on, Chrome asked Ku if he did not tell him before that drawing a good hand and using a good hand were two different things. Moreover, those who could handle a good hand well were dealt with even better hands. That was why Chrome stated that it was better to sit to let fate guide Ku. Ku then asked him if he meant that he should let luck be his strength. Chrome replied that this was a splendid way of putting it and that was exactly what he meant. He reminded Ku that he used a good hand well, and through that, he performed a miracle and accomplished great things and that was something to be proud of. Furthermore, Chrome requested Ku to believe in himself since he was looking forward to hearing of his strides from then on. After that, Ku decided to let luck be his strength. He would not have understood that if he was back in Japan. But then, he kind of got it. He realized that trusting himself a little more might not seem all that bad. On the following day, Iris was seen coming towards Ku in beautiful attire. She stated to Ku that she would be in his care for that day. Ku wondered to see her and she was looking like a whole different person in that dress. After that, they both went to a restaurant to have food. When Ku tasted the meal, he commented that this was delicious, exactly like when they were there last time. Iris stated as he mentioned it, this was the place where they talked about the ancient civilization and if that did not happen, Anan would not have been educated. Ku asked if that was not her skill, the one that found it. Iris replied that apart from the stampede, the black dragon was a scary one to fight and she told him honestly that she did not even want to fight it again. Further on, Iris asked him if there were no other calamities besides the black dragon. Ku answered positively that there were the calamities and he said that if another calamity does come, he would just have to work it out using Calamity Summon. Iris was surprised with that. She then asked him if he got yet another new skill. Ku replied in the positive way and he told that defeating the Black Dragon in one go let him gain 19 levels as well as a new skill which was the Calamity Summon. He added that by consuming MP, he could summon and command a subjugated Calamity Beast. Iris then continued that by summoning one, he was adding to the amount of calamities out there and she commented that he might be the real calamity there. Ku made it clear to her that he was a normal human no matter where she looked. Iris, while trying to cover things up, agreed with him that she was joking and stated that whether he was normal or not, she knew well that she was not a bad person. Besides, Ku told her that he met Milia on the way there. Milia would soon have to return to the guild headquarters at the royal capital. She added that Milia would surely be lonely there. Moreover, Ku guessed what he understood that they would award them at the capital, from the subjugation of the Black Dragon. Iris was amazed to hear that and she stated that the word had already spread out that far. Ku clarified that he did not know what life would bring anymore. Iris agreed with him, she told that five years ago, when she set out from her country, she never thought that things would end up that way. She further told the truth that she was always treated coldly back in the Dragon Folk Nation. Ku asked him if he could know the reason. She then disclosed her backstory that she had a twin sister. Her name was Ferris and she also had the skill of Dragon God Shrine Maiden. Ku surprisingly asked if the rare skill of the Dragon God Shrine Maiden did not actually come once every several hundred years. It was feeling quite unusual to him. Iris replied that she had Dragon God Shrine Maiden and Spearmanship. Ferris had Dragon God Shrine Maiden and Premonition and Precognition was accurate more than 90% of the time. Ferris had guessed the coming of countless disasters in the past and when she was six years old, she became a bona fide shrine maiden. 
Iris further added that she and Ferris were taught as shrine maidens at the temple and they just treated her as a spare. Then, when she was 15, the temple was attacked by the monsters and Ferris was killed. A shrine maiden's mission was to find the dragon god's shield and give the ruby to the transferor so, to carry out that mission. Iris departed with three guards once she turned 16. Though three days in, both the journey's funds and guards disappeared and they really did a number on Iris's soul. To hear the entire story, Ku understood that this was when Iris became an adventurer. Iris while taking a sip of drink gave credit to Ku that she carried out her duties and she could at last show her face to that girl. She thanked Ku and showed that she was grateful from the bottom of her heart. Ku smiled. He then asked her if what she would be doing from then on since her duties as a shrine maiden were then over, so he asked if she was planning on returning. She replied that she wanted to hold back on going home if possible, and asked Ku if she was still going to continue being an adventurer there. Ku refused and told her that sooner or later, he would go on a journey, go around and see everything there was in the world. Iris liked his idea. She asked him if it would be fine if she went with him. Ku was okay with that, but he initially cleared that he would mostly be sightseeing so he asked if she would not get bored. To know that, Iris surely stated that it would be fun. Ku looked at her for a moment and commented that she also kind of got changed. Iris wondered to hear that, since she was not too sure about that. She told that up until then, she had always thought that there was not anyone out there that would save her, that she did not have a friend in that world. That was why she only used her power for her survival. But then she was not that lost anymore for which she thanked Ku as she considered that it happened just because of him. Ku was astonished to hear that he was the reason. Iris then reminded him that when he slew that black spider, he came to save her and she was really really happy that he saved her life in more ways than one and even not just her life, but he also saved her emotionally. She expressed blissfully how glad she was to have met him and she claimed that she would be happy to stay with him from then on. The day had already passed and it was time to go back, so when they both came out of the restaurant, Iris called Ku while covering her face. Ku asked what the matter was. She stated that about that talk earlier, she asked if he could do her a favor and forget it. She further added that it was alcohol since she was shaking and she got caught in the moment. Ku then said that he was a bit tipsy too, and the memory was fuzzy. Iris was shocked to hear that but that was real. After that, Ku asked all of a sudden if she wanted to go for another round and Iris agreed with him to go. Their hands got slid against each other. At first they found it awkward but they then smiled and walked ahead for a round. The next scene shifted to the forest where Ku was enjoying the peace, and Iris was also there. She told him that there were a lot of mushrooms growing on the waterside over there and asked if he wanted to take a look. Ku agreed with her to have a look and thanked her for helping him in that quest. Iris happily exclaimed that there was no problem since she was helping him because she wanted to. Ku stated that they had been doing things together a lot recently, so he suggested if they apply to form a party when they returned to the guild. Iris clarified that unfortunately they could not form a party if the rank difference was above three ranks and she would be happy if they could form a party, though. She told him that there was no need to rush as he would receive an invitation letter from the Adventurers Guild in the capital soon enough. Moreover, she added that when that happens, he should be able to take a promotion exam and she declared that in his case, he might be able to get promoted without taking an exam. Thereafter, they both agreed to form a party. Iris again confirmed with Ku if he would agree to do it. Ku replied positively and he then confirmed with her if she was going to come with him on his journey. Iris also agreed with him since for her, it was fun being with him after all. Just then, Ku noticed something for which he asked Iris if those were monsters. Iris replied that it was okay since they were flying mushrooms, they were not harmful and they would run away when they saw the people. Ku thought that one would float when he ate it, which he found kind of like a wondrous mushroom. He guessed that he might be able to use them for creation. That was why he felt that he should collect them. Iris told him the strategy that if he wanted to collect them then she would block around them and block their escape path. But Ku clarified that there was no need to do that and he used the Godspeed Blessings X by which he flew in the air very fast. Iris remained stunned to see him but she then came to remember that he was as fast as always. Within a few moments when Ku returned back to Iris, he said that he had collected 56 of them. Iris wondered that he came back in two seconds, but she stated that she could not see anything along with him. After that, they both continued collecting materials. When they returned to Anan, it was already dawn. Ku was walking by the street. Just then a girl came who recognized Ku and she claimed that she was his big fan. She seemed too emotional while asking Ku to shake hands with him for once. Ku was surprised to see that all of a sudden and he shook hands with that girl. She stated that she wanted to become an adventurer like him for which she wanted to become Ku's student. There was another person who offered Ku to come by his shop for a drink next time. 
After that, the girl's mother came there and told her that she would be able to grow strong. Iris then stated to Ku that he was as popular as always, but for Ku, it was troubling him. A while after when they both arrived at the guild, Milia greeted them and thanked them for their good work. She told them excitedly that they too came at the perfect time since there were invitation letters for them sent from the Adventurer's Guild. When Ku took the invitation letter, he read that the award ceremony was in a month. Furthermore, Milia said that their trip to the royal capital would be arranged by the Scarlet Company, and for that purpose, she requested them to visit their office when they were available by the next day. When Ku heard about the Scarlet Company, he immediately remembered that it was Chrome's place. Iris then asked Milia what about her like if she would go to the award ceremony, or not. Milia replied positively. She said that it was just that she had a lot of things to do in that branch, so she thought that they would only be able to meet at the ceremony. Besides that, she wished them a happy journey and also disclosed that there was a lot of beautiful scenery on the way there about which she was sure that it would be fun for them. Ku was too happy to go to the royal capital and he could not just wait to go there. He was then seen in the field and the reason was that he wanted to try the new items that he had created before he slept. The first item was the ring that he created from the Black Dragon's corpses. It was the ring of the Flame Emperor Dragon whose granted effects were the Flame Emperor Successor X, an exclusive equipment a plus. The Flame Emperor Successor X had been activated and Flame Emperor skill had been added to Koi Kusaka's skill list. Just then, Ku felt that something had been installed. It seemed like not everyone could use magic in that world since one needed a skill that corresponded to the attribute. The Flame Emperor was the highest tier of flame magic and Ku could only use it when he was wearing the ring of the Flame Emperor Dragon. When Ku thought of trying it, a fire arrow came out of it which burned the things over there. To see that, Ku realized that this would be very useful. When Ku went to see there, nothing else was burned apart from the tree. He then thought if he could do the reverse and do an AA attack with it. He took a look behind and set his target which was a cluster of grass 30 meters from there and he decided that he was going to burn everything within a 10 meters radius with that location point as the center. He yelled the fire arrow and the flames burned at that distance. When Ku noticed it burning, he remained amazed with it since it only burned what he intended to burn, so that was going to be useful in fights. Thereafter, he suddenly saw a bunch of punch rabbits whom he considered monsters. They all simultaneously jumped over Ku to attack him and it instantly came to his mind that those punch rabbits would make good test subjects. In the very next moment, Ku aimed to mow them down and used his fire arrow. The fire flames stroke them and they all fall on the ground. Ku noticed that it precisely hit their hearts and he could kill them without damaging the materials. After that, Ku's status said that he had become level 92 and his HP and MP had been increased, and his physical performance had also improved. When Ku read his status, he felt that this was so out of proportion. It was then the time to test the item that he created from flying mushrooms and moist mushrooms which was the flying potion, and the granted effects were Wind Blessings S+. He took a sip of potion and wondered how it would feel to fly in the sky. The potion was delicious and it tasted like refined Japanese sake. As soon as he took the potion, he started floating in the air. He then tried to increase the altitude and when he arrived higher, it was such a wonderful view he got to see. After that, Ku tested various ways of flying and fully enjoyed flying in the sky until the effect expired. It was already past midnight when he returned to the quiet moon pavilion, and he had come up with a new recipe that after disassembling the punch rabbit's corpses, the punch rabbit fur created the punch rabbit underwear whose effect was that it was texture a plus and the temperature control s plus. Ku felt it was very nice and comfortable, so he wore it and went to sleep. In the next scene, Ku and Iris were seen together where Iris stated to him that they had been there many times but it was still a wondrous sight to behold, with which Ku also agreed. They were at the underground city where the slimes welcomed both of them back. Iris clarified that that was going to be very awkward. The slimes asked if they were going to leave. Ku replied positively, revealing that they were going to leave Anan in the near future, and he cleared that he would not be returning to the underground city for a while as well. The slimes got sad to hear that news, they stated that it would be lonely around there and asked him to return one day. A slime exclaimed sadly that it wanted to come with him, but it could not get out of the underground city. Ku then contemplated that by rewriting the main system of the underground city, it would be possible to bring one helper slime to a company above ground, so it was asked to key if he wanted to carry out the rewrite of the system. Ku gave permission for that, and all of a sudden, the slime's body started feeling warm. It asked Ku what was happening to him. Ku said that he was rewriting the system right then, since once it was done he would be able to go outside. The slime got very excited to know that he could come with Ku. He seemed very happy to accompany Ku. 
After that, it was asked to Ku to give a name to the helper slime that would be accompanying him. Iris asked Ku if he was going to give the slime that would come with them a name for which she suggested the names Osis or Suala. But those did not feel like good names, however, he realized that her idea of taking its race name was not bad. That was why, he started to think and asked how about Sarara. As soon as the helper slime heard that name, he got very happy and started bouncing. He thanked you for the wonderful name. Thereafter, Sarara stated that he was starting to feel sleepy. Ku thought if it was because of the system were right in progress or it might be like a computer update that required a reboot. The other helper slime started to put Sarara to bed. They also claimed to give the present to Ku. When Ku asked about the present, the helper slime got embarrassed since he wanted to keep that secret. So, Ku said that they were saying it out loud and even Iris said that she heard it. Further on, the slime told Ku and Iris since they were going on a journey soon, so he had got some good stuff in the warehouse in the underground city that he wanted them to take a look at. And they brought up the carriages. Sarara disclosed to them that those were carriages made in the days of ancient civilization, and each of the carriage's interiors were different. When Ku and Iris went inside it to see, Sarara showed that there was a kitchen installed inside and there one had two soft beds installed, moreover, the other had a second floor. After having a look at the interiors, Iris suggested that if all of those carriages were to be combined, it could be an amazing carriage. Sarara then stated that he wanted Ku to use creation using those carriages as materials, since he thought that you could make an awesome carriage from them. Ku understood that, and he was going to try the new recipe. After that, he used his skill of creation by which a grand cabin appeared there whose granted effects were physical defense enhancement, magic defense enhancement, wind defense, and golem combination. Ku and Iris remained amazed to see that grand cabin. With the acquisition of skill experience, creation was then ranked 16 and the skill functions had been added. Ku realized that this skill function expansion was convenient. In the past, he could only use the items in the item box as materials for creation. But from then on, Ku could use materials outside the item box for creation as long as he was touching them directly. In short, he did not need to put them into his item box anymore. Ku then asked Iris to go inside to try it on. Iris seemed very excited to go since that was the first time in her life that she had seen a carriage that luxurious. When they both entered the carriage, there was the living room. Sarara was bouncing on the couches and enjoying it. Iris also felt it was phenomenal. There was the dining room, kitchen, two bedrooms on the second floor, and the toilet had a bathtub in it. It looked very comfortable and luxurious. Ku stated that they could normally use the carriage as their home and Iris added that it was almost like a moving house. Sarara asked Ku how he was going to move the carriage. Even Iris agreed with that question since it should be heavy, therefore, they probably would need 10 horses or more. To know that problem, Ku took Iris out of the carriage and summoned the golem. When the golem came, he stated that it had been a while, so he requested Ku to give his command. Iris was surprised with that golem. Ku then told the golem that they were going on a journey, and their carriage was a super big size which was why he asked if he could put it on. The golem told him to leave it to him. Thereafter, it was asked to Ku if he wanted to combine the destroyer golem with the grand cabin to which Ku accepted. The fusion of the grand destroyer golem was made whose granted effects were advanced calculation function monster detection, eternal engine, and increased power. After that, Iris and Ku went inside the Grand Destroyer cabin which moved very fast and it looked like Ku and Iris could reach their destination way faster than with a normal carriage. After discussing with the Scarlet Company about their travel schedule, they decided to slowly travel to Fort Port while sightseeing in other cities. It was five days before the departure. During that time, Ku greeted all those who had helped him, tidying up the house and the inn, replenishing items and ingredients. All of them were done in three days. He then received a letter from a relic in which it was written that it seemed the lord of this territory, Count Millard, was staying in the northeastern city of Surrier to recuperate, and the writer was curious about his condition, so he was going to visit him. Ku actually had been pretty curious about it. The lord did not do anything when the stampede happened and the black dragon appeared. It seemed like the relic was curious about it as well and went to visit him. He took his job seriously, so Ku was worried something might have happened to him. On a different subject, he heard that Ku was going to receive an award in the royal capital for which he was planning to attend the ceremony. So Relic claimed to see Ku there. Ku thought that Relic was in Surrier so he had a hope that he might meet him there. On the next day, Ku kind of wanted a tourist guide and books to read while traveling. Ku was then seen in the library where he was setting the books. Just there he found Milia holding a number of books and suddenly got slipped and all the books fell down. But you picked up the books and when Ku asked her if she was okay, Milia was surprised to see him there. 
The scene then shifted to the home of Milia, and she thanked you for carrying the books all the way to her home. Moreover, she requested him to let her return the favor with something. Ku asked her not to worry, since she had been taking care of him, so this was just him returning the favor. But Milia insisted and clarified that she would feel bad if she did not return the favor with anything. Ku then suggested to her to think of it as her owing him one, and as she was going to the award ceremony, she could return the favor when they met in the capital. Ku further added that she could tell him the restaurants that she recommended or take him to tourist spots, and he agreed to leave it to her choice. To hear that, Milia wondered and she understood. She told him to think of a way to return the favor with all her might. She claimed that he would regret giving her time to prepare, but concluding the topic she saw him off by saying that they would look forward to the next time they meet. Ku realized that it was looking like things were going to be interesting in the capital. It was the day of departure, and Milia was giving flowers to Ku and Iris with wishes for their good journey. When they both went into the grand cabin, Golem confirmed with Ku if he was ready to go, and Ku excitedly answered him positively. Thus, they departed from Onan. On the way, they joined with Sarara, and he seemed happy with the present that Iris gave them. With that hat, he would not mistake Sarara for a wild slime. After coming in the carriage, Sarara went to Golem to introduce himself and asked his name as well. When Ku heard that, he came to think of it, he had not named Golem yet. Just then, Iris suggested the names Destez or Tom Tom, and Ku asked for the name Dest. Thus, the name for the destroyer Golem had been decided, and they continued their journey to the capital. Their destination for that day was Tao. It seemed like the city was popular for its beef meat. Ku then was seen reading the book and thinking that apparently, there was a place called Meat Street where many meat-based restaurants were lined up, and Ku was looking forward to having dinner. He wondered how long it had been since he could leisurely read a book like that. After he became a full-fledged member of society, he was busy with work every day, and it was almost like a dream that he could spend time leisurely like that. After that, Ku was feeling dozing off. On the other hand, Sarara was too excited since they were about to arrive, and he could not wait. A while after, they finally reached their destination, Tao. When Sarara peeped out, he noticed that there were not many people. Iris asked if they were welcoming them, but the atmosphere was too turbulent for that. Ku said that there might be a monster near the city. When they came out of the carriage, a person came to Ku and confirmed with him if he was the dragon slayer, Ku. When Ku told him that he was that one, the person went on his knees and told him that he had been waiting for him. The person seemed too scared as well as in problem. He begged Ku to save their city. Ku stated that it seemed like trouble was brewing. The person then took Ku and Iris to the room where he first apologized to them for asking that in the middle of their journey. He then introduced himself as the branch master of Tao's Adventurer's Guild, named Popolo. Ku asked him directly if he could tell him the situation. Popolo said that around one hour ago, a dangerous s plus rank monster called Devil Treant appeared in the northeastern Second Plains. Once it started rampaging, it could destroy Tor in less than half a day, and because of its advanced regeneration ability, it was very difficult to subjugate the monster. Popolo stated that currently, he had asked a traveling priest to stall the Devil Treant for a while, but because it happened so suddenly, they had not been able to evacuate the residents or organize a subjugation force. He claimed that he was aware of Ku's achievements since he had heard that Ku defeated a powerful monster called the Black Dragon. So, he asked Ku if he could use that power to defeat the Devil Treant. Ku held for a moment and agreed, but he wanted to correct one thing that he did not defeat the Black Dragon by himself. He, while pointing at Iris, told that she also fought with him. Iris wondered to hear that like she was doubting if he was really talking about her. Just then, Sarara spoke up that he knew about that too, that Iris protected Ku from the Black Dragon's flame with the Dragon God Shield. Popolo then came to know that Ku and Iris both defeated the Black Dragon. Therefore, he requested both of them to save your sins for him. They too were their only hope. After that, the three of them came out of that room, and Sarara asked Ku and Iris why they were outside the carriage. Ku replied that it was to get a better view. Iris also added that it was better to be able to see things with their own eyes. After that, Iris thanked you for earlier about the Black Dragon when he told Popolo that he was fighting together with her. Ku then claimed that she was his precious friend, so he had to tell him. He then asked her if what was the matter since Iris was standing holding the barrier in her hand. Iris, being confident, asked Ku just to leave the defense to her. Just then, Sarara asked them to have a look immediately over there. 
Fu remained astonished to see that there was a devil treant in the face of the tree who had chains on its hands and legs. It was such a huge monster. Iris stated that those shining chains were the celestial chain which was an advanced holy magic spell to restrain the opponents. But there were not many magicians who could restrain a devil threat. The caster must be quite skilled. Ku understood that it must be the priest that the Popolo branch master mentioned. Sarara suddenly noticed that the chains were breaking and the devil treant was moving. Ku and Iris seemed a little scared to see him and in the very next moment, a girl was seen running. Ku wondered that she was running out of magic power, so he stated to Des that they needed to retrieve the priest hurriedly. Best understood and he accelerated the grand cabin, and Ku ran to pick that girl up. When he saw her fainted, he noticed that she was still a kid. To protect everybody, Iris used her dragon god barrier X and covered themselves. Ku appreciated her, and there, Sarara told you that he would take care of the girl. Sarara then decided to swell up a little. Ku wanted to see Sarara since he had a lot of questions regarding that, but they would have to come later according to him. Firstly, he asked Sarara to take the girl to the bed. After that, Ku joined Iris, and she welcomed him back. Ku declared that he was back and he asked Iris how she was. She replied happily that she was better than when she fought the black dragon, but she still needed to get some rest. Ku understood, and he told Des that they were going to take some distance from the devil train, so he commanded him to get away from the devil train as fast as he could. Des followed the command and took the grand cabin back. Iris then sighed and stated that they should be safe there. Afterwards, Ku took out his sword and told Iris that he would leave a little present for her. He suddenly jumped and used the skill of God of War Slash to slash the Devil Treant down. The attack was so powerful that it resulted in cutting down the leg of the Devil Treant. But Ku noticed that it regenerated its left leg in an instant and he wondered to see its incredible regeneration ability. Iris further alerted Ku to be careful since its branches were coming. The Devil Treant then threw its branches as the attack and there, Ku used his fire arrow and set the target at all the branches. He commanded not to let any of them get close. The fire arrows did their job so beautifully even Iris was surprised with them. She asked Ku if he learned to use magic. He said that just recently he tried it. Iris further added that if he could use fire magic, things would get a lot easier. Ku asked what was the matter. She replied that there were two ways to defeat the Devil Treant. One was a prolonged battle of brute force to keep attacking until its regeneration ability reached its limit. Ku asked if she meant that he could just keep running around while shooting the God of Wars slash S+. She replied positively, but there was a problem in that as it would take time that way. Ku then asked for the other way. She said that it was a short duration battle with fire magic as if he burned off its head completely. The devil treant would die before regenerating and she recommended the second way. Ku was okay with that, since the longer the fight goes on, the more likely that an unforeseen event would occur. Therefore, the sooner it's settled, the better it would be. But, Ku asked which part was the devil treant's head. She showed him the face at the upper part and asked him just to imagine burning all of that. Ku understood that, but since the devil threat was a bit huge, he needed to get closer and when he started to take a bag out of the magic, Iris surprisingly asked what that was. Ku disclosed that it was the flying potion which he created from the flying mushrooms that they collected from the forest and he also told her that he could fly if he drank it. So, Iris asked his strategy that he was going to fly with that position and attack the devil treant from the air, moreover, she commented that he was always full of surprises. Ku replied positively for what she guessed the strategy as it was all when he summed it up, and he then was going to do it. When he was about to have it, Iris stopped him and stated that she also wanted to come. She told him the technique that he would focus on attacking, and she would focus on defending and that was how she thought the things would go much easier with the two of them. Ku was quite impressed with her, and they both had the drink thereafter. When they started flying, Iris seemed to be enjoying it, and she wondered with that strange feeling like she was being lifted into the air. Ku then asked her if she was afraid, but she was fine after all he was with her. Ku realized that Iris trusted him a lot and in that case, he felt that he should respond to her trust. After that, Ku ordered Des to get to safety. He followed the orders and wished him luck for the battle. After that, Ku needed to get a bit closer for his fire arrow to be within range and as he was going closer, the devil treant started moving towards him. By analyzing him, Ku understood that it noticed his killing intent. When the devil treant came there to attack them, Iris came before Ku same as earlier to protect him and created a barrier. She then asked Ku to do his magic. Ku set the target, the head of the devil treant, immediately and he used all of his magic power for a one-shot kill. Iris then claimed to lift the barrier and just then, Ku released the fire arrows and it seemed that the head got burned. 